there was some confusion. I think she thought it was no longer needed. Um, Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, it is March 26, 2024, and this is the Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 1232, and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember McDonald? Here. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Stapp? Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Fleming. Thank you. Moving on to item two, um, we have items 2.1 and 2.2 on our closed session uh, for today. Uh, today is a special meeting and we will be addressing on 2.1 conference with legal counsel with existing lit litigation and 2.2 conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation. And with that, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on these items? Mayor, there is no one in council chamber to provide public comment on these closed session items. Thank you so much. And with that, we will recess to closed session. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now resume our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rogers. Here. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember McDonald. Here. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez. Vice Mayor Stapp. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Alvarez and Councilmember Fleming. Thank you. Looking to Madam City Attorney, can you please give us a report out on closed session? Thank you, Madam Mayor. There was no reportable action taken during closed session. And with that, we will adjourn this special meeting. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of the meeting. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available. 
and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear Spanish translation. Pablo, will you please restate this in Spanish? Para los que recién se unen a la reunión, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y cualquier persona o personal que desee escuchar en español podrá unirse al canal. Para unirse, haga clic en el icono de interpretaciones que ahora aparece en la barra de funciones de Zoom como un globo terraqueo. Una vez se une al canal de español, se recomienda que apague el audio primario para que solo escuche la interpretación al español. Again, welcome everyone to our March 26, 2024 Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 1.44 and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing, oh, seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Council Member Rogers. Here. Council Member Okrepke. Here. Council Member McDonald. Here. Council Member Fleming is absent. Council Member Alvarez. Present. Council Vice Mayor Stapp. Here. And Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Fleming. We will now proceed to item three, which are our closed session items for today. Um, we have 3.1, conference with real property negotiator, 3.2, conference with legal counsel about existing litigation, and 3.3, conference with legal counsel um, about existing litigation. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on these items? Yes, thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on the closed session items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4. If you'd like to make a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. The first public comment will be from James Duncan. James, please go ahead. I'm James Duncan. I have participated in virtually all of the official proceedings regarding the Jennings Avenue rail crossing, including CPUC proceeding A1505014. The community organizations that have expressed their support for the Jennings crossing to the city council, the smart board of directors, and the California Public Utilities Commission include the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, Bicycle Santa Rosa, Sierra Club, Sonoma County Transportation and Land Use Coalition, Friends of SMART, Sonoma County Conservation Action, Greenbelt Alliance, Disability Services and Legal Center, North Bay Organizing Project, and the League of Women Voters. The City Council has been wonderfully steadfast in support of the Jennings Crossing. The Jennings Crossing application has been approved repeatedly by the CPUC, but the crossing is still closed. SMART's role in the continuing closure is well documented in public records and by the Press Democrat. The extraordinary challenges for the city of Santa Rosa cannot be forgotten. The disastrous Tubbs fire in which so much was lost by so many, other wildfires, civic unrest, and COVID. But the people of Santa Rosa and their city have stood up to those challenges and turned to rebuilding and recovery. The council is urged as part of that recovery to direct that the Jennings Crossing be built and reopened for public use. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Keith. Good afternoon, Keith Rogel, 4040 at Sonoma Highway, Napa, California. 
Uh, I'm here in that I'm aware that the matter of Garage 5 and its hoped for future is certainly a topic for the council and that it has been and will be, I'm sure, in the near future. And I thought it would just be appropriate for me to briefly make an appearance and just give us a small update. Um, I'll begin the update though with stepping back. It was about five years ago when uh, I and partners turned our strong attention to downtown Santa Rosa. We were motivated by tremendous efforts made by the staff at the time and the council. Um, real breakthroughs regarding the Courthouse Square and a wide variety of regulatory changes that we thought were um, remarkable in their initiative and creativity in order to encourage a dense downtown development. Um, since we began, at that point we, we retained superb land planning uh, experts that we've used before to really look at the whole of the downtown and identify sites that had the greatest potential. And from our perspective, the Garage 5 site was one of the most compelling in terms of its ability to be transformative. That is to say, to take something um, that has a current use and condition which is poor uh, and make something that would be substantial, be beautiful, and be useful for a variety of city residents and visitors. Uh, it seemed a, a tremendously appealing site in that regard and we in turn made an investment on 4th Street to buy a property that would be contiguous in order to further enhance the potential for the redevelopment of the garage site, so 644th Street. Uh, since that time, as the prior speaker alluded to, there have been a few changes. Uh, the matter of the pandemic, um, tremendous spike in interest rates, the inflation as a result of the pandemic uh, and other matters, and some changes in the Surplus Land Act. So a number of years have passed. What has not passed is our interest, our sincere belief that it's an exceptional site, our view and our confidence that we can transform it into a site that would accommodate the parking that the city desires, uh, housing, uh, both market rate housing at a significant level, which has been very difficult to finance, but we think will be feasible there, inclusionary affordable, and uh, accommodate a space for a daycare, public park, and a children's playground area. We're committed to doing it. We're excited to do it. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mayor. I do not see anyone else in council chamber wishing to provide public comment. Thank you very much, and with that, we will recess into closed session.
Mic check. Loud and clear.
All right, welcome everyone to our March 26th Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 4.04 and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember McDonald? Here. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Stapp? Here. Mayor Rogers? Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Fleming. Thank you. Moving on to item six, uh, which would be our closed session uh, item. Madam City Attorney, would you like to report out? Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, there is no action, no reportable action from closed session. Thank you. Thank you, and Madam City Clerk, would you like to facil facilitate public comment on that item? Uh, we, we took public there. comment on um, ahead of closed session on those items. Perfect. We have no proclamations for today, no staff briefings. Item nine, City Manager and City Attorney reports. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of council. I have no updates to report tonight. And th thank you again, Madam Mayor and council members. I also have no report this evening. Thank you. Moving very quickly through this agenda. I like it. I like it. Uh, item 10, statements of abstention by council members. Seeing none. We will continue uh, to item 11, which are. Madam Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. My apologies. I do have a report this evening. Uh, I thought we so, do, but I didn't. We do have a lit. Thank you. And I thank the clerk for um, reminding me. Um, there is a litigation report, um, and I'm pulling up that item right now. We forgive you. It's been a long day already, Madam, Madam Attorney. Madam Mayor, would you mind skipping this item and coming back? I can come I, back. I am trying to pull up the item now. Thank you. My apologies. No problem. So we will continue with item 11, uh, which is our mayor and council members' reports. Um, I will start off with the reporting today, doing something a little different. Um, so I would like to uh, first request an item be placed on the agenda. Um, I would like staff to look at the impacts of vacating portions of 4th Street temporarily. Um, this request is being made to promote economic and community vibrancy, which is a priority of the council. And so I would be looking to um, council members. Second. All right. So I have a... I'm sorry. Can I get clarification if that's a temporary vacation or? It, uh, it would be temporary. Okay, thank you. So I have a, um, an item that I requested to be placed on the agenda and it, I have a second from Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. I will place it on a future agenda, the next um, available uh, agenda that meets our open government criteria. It may be the 9th, but most likely it will be on the April 16th agenda to um, have further action taken. Perfect. And thank you, uh, Council Member Rogers, for that support. Um, I would also like to report out on the ad hoc or the ad hoc that we have with uh, Santa Rosa School Board. So the ad hoc committee um, has met uh, a few times and we've determined that the best direction to establish is to establish an SRO program uh, and that would be to engage a working group which is comprised of staff members. Um, the working group has been tasked with uh, developing an MOU and setting the foundation necessary for implementing a pilot program. The working group is actively engaged in regular meetings, but due to the timing of the school year, an SRO program by August is not feasible. Additionally, during the ad hoc meeting, school representatives acknowledge there are not sufficient funds uh, for them to support 
such program and the rolling out of a program. The city remains committed to working to finalize a pilot program to present to the ad hoc committee for the school board's approval. So that is the status and update on our engagement with the school board right now. Uh, moving on, I had the privilege of attending a community meeting at South Park on February 28th with, with Council Member Alvarez. At the meeting, I was able to meet residents, but also hear the concerns they had regarding traffic parks and public uh, safety presence, to name uh, a few things. And on February 29th, I was able to attend the 2020, 2022 Service Awards for employees and retirees who achieved service milestones. Um, and so it was very nice to, to be there and to be able to honor those that are giving back and uh, providing service to our community that work within the city. In March 21st, I attended the North Bay Monthly Executive Meeting, which was held at Finley Community Center. Did I say 21st? I hope I said March 1st, but I don't remember. Probably said 21st, so March 1st. Uh, on March 1st, I also attended the Police Annual Awards Dinner, honoring those that serve our community in multiple capacities to ensure that we are safe. I would like to thank the Technical Services Division, Special Services Division, Field Services Division, and Administration, and a special thank you to our wonderful Chief uh, for the love that you put into the job. And thank you all for your service. And um, Your, sorry, your service and the congratulations to all that were honored um, that evening. On March 5th and 6th, I was honored to attend the Yale Mayor's College and CEO Caucus, which was held in Washington, D.C. This was the 10th Yale Mayor's College and 142nd CEO event. I would like to thank the Yale School of Management for the invitation to collaborate with 39 other mayors um, and former mayors from across the country and thank the senior associate dean jeffrey sonnenfield for the opportunity march 10th through the 14th uh, myself along with others were able to attend the nlc congressional city conference in washington dc um, vice mayor staff councilwoman mcdonald uh, city manager and other members of the team while in dc we were able to meet with uh, Representative Mike Thompson, Representative Jared Huffman, Senator, we met with a lot of people in a lot of departments um, to advocate to, to get more resources uh, for our city. And I think we did a really good job. So I wanted to thank the team that uh, attended and went. And on March 15th, um, I attended the Hearn Avenue Interchange Groundbreaking. Uh, the groundbreaking represented the third phase of this multi-phase project, which started many years ago when the council member uh, to my right, council member Rogers, was only three years old. So that's a big, a big thing, and it's been a long time. So it was definitely um, very nice to attend that. Council member Rogers, Alvarez, Okrepke, and Fleming were present, and thank you to SCTA, Caltrans, city staff, um, and our city. Uh, everyone that has worked on our city project team and everyone that has worked on the project. Thank you to the city bus operator who made sure that we arrived uh, to and from the site. That was uh, very nice, so uh, thank you to that department. And also thank you to Congressman Thompson, Senator Pro Tem McGuire, and Assembly Member Connolly for their continued support and investment into Santa Rosa and our region as a whole. We are definitely uh, better working together. And I will look to, that was long, I'm sorry, you guys, I missed a council meeting. I will look to my council members to see if anyone else has a report, um, and we'll go to Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I'll piggyback just really briefly and say thank you to everybody for the Hearn groundbreaking as well. It is a long time coming, and I know that this council made dif difficult decisions about a year ago to consolidate funds and make sure that we really got that project across the finish line. And want to thank SCTA and RCPA for stepping in as project managers to help out with that as well. Uh, on a related note, uh, last month I passed the gavel officially as the chair of SCTA RCPA after two months, and so the new chair 
chair is Supervisor Linda Hopkins. Uh, she'll have a two-year term there, and I know that we've got a really good working relationship with the supervisor, so look forward to that continuing. We had an economic development subcommittee meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I want to thank the mayor. One of the discussion points that we had was about adding to the agenda a closure for 4th Street. Uh, that actually, uh, just to flush out a little bit what we were hoping for, and I'll see whether the, the motion still carries, is from D Street down to the square, jumping the square, and then continuing from essentially La Rosa to B Street, so that it both closes off and allows for bicycle and pedestrian access, but also allows that flow at the square for some of that parking, and we've done that before. I think that'd be a good starting point for our discussion uh, when we bring that forward. The other item uh, that we were really interested in bringing forward is a new way to activate vacant parcels, particularly in our downtown. There are a number of parcels that right now don't provide any real amenities to our downtown. And in particular, I know Councilmember Okrepke was interested in having a children's playground uh, or something that could be a pop-up utilization of space until a project does continue to move forward just to create more vibrancy. Uh, so I'll look to, I'll make a motion to add that. Second. Perfect. Uh, and then finally, we also had uh, what was the uh, first uh, open government task force meeting in about a year where we did discuss a number of, of items that I'm just looking for thumbs up uh, from the mayor and council members for the open government task force to work on uh, specifically updating the lobbyist ordinance uh, as well as uh, independent expenditure reforms that had been previously proposed and I believe that uh, my colleague here will add a couple things potentially as well uh, but again just a huge thank you to everybody uh, those meetings were actually really well uh, I, I felt like uh, productive on moving things forward. Councilmember Alvarez. Yeah, I do want to start by thing, saying thank you on behalf of District 1 for, for the efforts, sacrifices, and the commitment from the City of San Rosa and so many other partners throughout the state of California to assure that District 1 infrastructure equals the amount of housing that's been introduced into the area. So really, it, it's it's much more than, than just this dollar amount that, that I know is, is, it's a great amount. But when you look, even in the backdrop, uh, as we sat there uh, introducing our speakers and, and digging the shovel into the ground, you saw uh, a mother uh, with her two children running over the overpass and what that actually means when it comes to the quality of life of the residents of Santa Rosa as a whole. Uh, want to inform, actually, I believe you spoke about the the event that we held at, at South Park, and that was great. I mean, uh, just, I, and the story that I remember most is hearing a mother say how she was scared to let her child outside of the house to uh, to play. And now she lets her, her daughter walk the poodle around the neighborhood. And so I, I figured if you let the poodles run free, it shows that we're in the right direction, barring the, the dog pound, right? Um, in regards to the Open uh, Government Task Force, uh, it, it is true we spoke about the lobbyists, we spoke about many other, other uh, issues that are pertaining to the city of Santa Rosa. And we're also looking at the signage ordinances, and we were looking at, at how we can actually increase the communication from, from CAB as well, and how we could actually get them on board into the efforts of, of City of Santa Rosa, and really what CAB was meant to do in its, its, its origination, which really to increase participation and information to and from the City of Santa Rosa uh, Policymakers Council to the community that, that we serve. Um, is there anything else that I have here? Let me see. I want to congratulate Walsh. Uh, for his appointment to the retirement uh, board, uh, he actually 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 did that on the, on the prior meeting. So again, I just want to congratulate him for the great work that he's done with the BPU in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, and also want to congratulate one of our, our our business owners here in the city of Santa Rosa, Eddie's from Eddie's Kitchen. Not only because of the namesake, but the man is producing great food, and he's really bringing a revitalization when it comes to the business owners of the city of Santa Rosa. So definitely want to congratulate him as well. Thank you, Councilmember Okrepke. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. 
Um, so earlier this month, uh, Sonoma County LAFCO met and gave feedback on the Disadvantaged Unincorporated Communities Study, uh, which is not complete. They were seeking some guidance on it. Um, and so uh, the commission gave some feedback, as well as we heard the municipal, uh, municipal services review outcome that uh, our city had requested, um, which I'm sure will be coming forward at a future time. Um, and um, it was some great information uh, that will help us both uh, with our services going forward and, and possibly economically. Um, uh, I also had the chance to meet with SETEA uh, Executive Director James Cameron um, as an alternate. I don't attend all the meetings because for some reason Councilmember Rogers likes to go to every single meeting um, and uh, I rarely have the opportunity to interact with him. <laughs> I got one, um, but uh, I'll be able to sit down with him and talk about the future of uh, SETA and, and, and uh, transit in, uh, in our community. Um, on um, the uh, 13th, um, I was able to meet, uh, actually, um, I was not able to meet, I was able to attend a um, uh, an event held by Providence Memorial Hospital with the, uh, some of our, both of our assistant city managers um, to hear what they have going on at the, the hospital as well as some of the f um, future issues they're facing in terms of legislation that's been passed and seismic retrofitting and um, uh, as well as take a tour of their facility uh, and so I was uh, grateful to have the opportunity to do that um, and then the very next day I was able to have um, lunch with Representative Jared Huffman uh, who met with my colleagues the day before and and um, just able to dis discuss with him uh, his newly incorporated uh, parts of Santa Rosa that fall into his district and what some of our needs are and what some of our um, uh, some things we can collaborate uh, on um, and then um, that is it aside from uh, if I can if I step out of line please let me know um, I just want to say that um, uh, Two weeks ago, um, a great man passed away, a 99-year-old World War II veteran who led um, some mobile home um, uh, um, uh, revitalization and, and efforts to, to fight for the rights of mobile home owners. Um, he's a former police officer, former lineman for the, for the phone company, and he's also happened to be uh, my grandfather. So I just want to say, um, uh, acknowledge that because he, he did a lot for his community. <clears throat> totally not out of line, and our condolences are with you. We're sorry that you lost your grandfather. Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. So I have a few announcements to make. One of them, I wanted to say thank you so much to the Parks Department for hosting our Arbor Day at Skyhawk Park, where we had over 70 volunteers attend and we planted over 37 trees. So I just want to say thank you so much for them hosting that there. It was very successful. This was an area that had been hit by the glass fire. So it was great to have so many community members come out and staff members as well to come out and assist um, with planting of the trees and yes I actually dug a hole and <laughs> planted a tree mayor I want you to know my shoes are still muddy from that day so um, I just want to say thanks again for that that great event um, I just a couple highlights I was able to attend the um, legislative conference in Washington DC along with mayor and vice mayor and it was always a great opportunity to go and meet with our legislators to advocate on behalf of the city but there was over a thousand city um, elected officials that actually went to Capitol Hill and I think that that's pretty significant when we're looking at what we're trying to do on behalf of the communities that we represent but we were able to hear President Biden speak to the group which was quite a highlight to be able to hear our president speak as well as um, I attended a luncheon from the Biden Harris House poly housing policy agenda and there was a couple of great things that came out of that specific meeting about um, how many homes are being um, uh, funded if it goes through Congress and 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 uh, through the whole process but they are attempting to have about two million affordable housing projects go through um, first-time home buyer incentives workforce housing is a part of the policy agenda and it is known that over the last 15 years they have exasperated all of the housing because um, we've had a real a decrease in in those building right now um, in addition to the last couple of weeks, I also had a meeting, or we also had a meeting of the Violence Prevention Program. 
there's just a few announcements from that particular meeting. The choice grant cycle release date is coming up. It's going to be on April 2nd, and those applications are due by May 9th. We had a presentation from Dr. Perliot, who is um, the um, executive director of a group called Man to Man. It's an urban youth advocate group that particularly focus on, uh, on boys who do not have male presence or children who do not have a male presence in their home. And um, so he gave us some statistics that there's about 20 million children in America that live without the physical presence of a father in their homes. He shared with us about a program that he runs out of San Quentin and the benefits of helping um, even inmates understand their role as a parent. And so um, that was a that was a great presentation. We also um, had an update from our outreach team that is working with our schools and um, that they've been able to join some of the restorative justice circles, that they've been able to assist law enforcement when it's appropriate. And so we see a real collaboration with our violence prevention program and partners um, and with our school system as well. And then the last meeting that um, I went to was I am a member of the um, North Bay Cities, it's a League of Cities um, conference that we held in Burbank this last week. We had an update on the governor's budget and how that's going to affect the cities as well as a presentation and updates on the Public Records Act, which was riveting. And then we had an update on CalPERS as well as we went through all the legislative agenda for the California cities. So with that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my report. Thank you very much and we'll let Vice Mayor Staff wrap us up. Thank you, Mayor. It was a, it's been a busy few weeks for the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency. We've had two meetings in the past couple of weeks. Uh, on March 14th, we had a regularly scheduled meeting where we received the annual water report. A little bit of good news for the community. Our groundwater levels are recovering nicely after, after a few years of drought. So obviously we're monitoring groundwater levels very, very carefully, um, but we're in good shape right now as far as the county goes. Um, and then on March 25th, there was a special meeting for the, for the GSA. And the reason for that special meeting was also a bit of good news. A few months ago, the GSA received a $5.4 million grant, and that affected both our budget for 2023 and 2024, and then also our 2024-2025 budget. So we needed a special meeting to adjust the budgets for, for both of those years. Um, but again, the, the receipt of that grant means that the GSA gets to do a, a bunch of good new work for the, for the county and for our groundwater supplies. Um, at that meeting, there was also an, an extended discussion around the current groundwater extraction fees. That's going to be a hot topic in the months to come, uh, especially for our ag community. Those rates may be adjusted. Uh, there will be discussions ongoing for the next, in, over the next couple of months. Um, but all, all groundwater users in, in the county will be watching those, those rate discussions pretty carefully. So more news to come on that. Uh, and then just one, one addendum to the, to the mayor's report. Uh, both she and I were, were at the long-term financial policy and audit subcommittee meeting last week. Uh, and the main item of discussion was a deep dive into the budget for the Bennett Valley Golf Course and how it's, how it's been operating this year. Um, that will be coming, that, a, a version of that discussion will be coming to council here in a few months, so stay tuned. Um, but again, based on the report we received, we're very happy with Touchstone, our operator. Um, there are some, there, the, the golf course is on good footing at present, although the city is gonna have some big infrastructure decisions to make over the, over the next couple of years. That's it. Thank you very much. And with that, Madam City Clerk, can you please facil facilitate public comment? Thank you, we are now taking public comment on item 11. If you are in the council chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that po period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium and no one has submitted a speaker card. Thank you, and with that, we will now go back up to item nine, which is city manager and city attorney's report, and I believe we have a report from Madam City Attorney. Yes, yes, thank you, Mayor, and again, my apologies. Um, we have, I do have a litigation report uh, that was included in the agenda materials for um, our litigation report for February 2024. So just a reminder, this is a snapshot a snapshot in time um, as of the end of February. Um, 
uh, we have no settlements over $50,000 um, occurred in February. Um, our caseload remains fairly consistent with approximately 30 litigation matters. Um, Many cases are currently in discovery phase with trial dates assigned to most matters. We continue to try to resolve smaller cases with little or no cost to the city. And that is the end of my report, if there are any questions. Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 9.1, the report of settlements. If you'd like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium if you have not already submitted a speaker card. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium for public comment on 9.1. Perfect. So we will continue um, and we are at 11.2, which is our board a commission and committee appointments. Um, I will be making the appointments today and asking council um, to approve those appointments. I would like to say by state law, the housing authority must select their own chair. In addition, the waterways advisory committee um, selects their own chair. So with that, uh, art in public places, I would like to uh, reappoint and bombing gardener. There we go. Uh, and bicycle and pedestrian advisory board, Kim Broughtonfort, uh, board of building regulation and appeals. There is no appointment for that one. And board of community services, Logan Pitts, board of public utilities, Dan Galvin, uh, community advisory board, Callum Weeks, cultural heritage board, Brian Muser and Design Review Board, Melanie Jones Carter, uh, Public Safety and Prevention Tax Citizens Oversight Committee, Yvette Minor, Housing Authority, who appoints their own, uh, Personnel Board, Lisa Maldonado, Planning Commission, uh, Karen Weeks, and Waterway, Water Advisory Committee selects their own chair. So, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? on these appointments. Thank you, we are now taking public comment on item 11.2.1. .1. If you are in the council chamber and would like to make comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. Again, you will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one make a move to the podiums for 11.2.1. .1. All right. Um, so it is my recommendation that one of you give me a second for the appointments that I would like to make for the second. Them. Thank you very much. With that, can we call the vote? Thank you. Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. And Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show that passes with seven, seven affirmative, pardon me, six affirmative votes. Thank you. Moving on to item 12, which are our minutes. We have two sets of minutes, February 27, 2024, and March 5th, 2024. Uh, Council, are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing no corrections to the minutes, Madam City Clerk, can you, oh, do you have one? Madam Mayor, I just need to abstain from February 27th um, approval of those minutes. Okay. Um, and I would like to say that I was not present for March 5th, but I did take the time to review um, the meeting and the minutes. So. so with that, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on those two sets of minutes? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on items 12.1 and 12.2, the minutes for February 27th and March 25th regular meetings. If you are in the chamber and would like to make a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You'll have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums on this item. All right, and so with that, we'll adopt the minutes as presented. Moving on to our consent items. Madam City Clerk, can you please read the consent items? Thank you, Mayor. Item 13.1, 
Uh, motion for Finley Aquatic Center Spray Ground and Renovation Project Contingency Action. Item 13.2. Resolution bid award approval and issuance of a purchase order for the purchase of two Ford Transit X2C body style passenger vans. Item 13.3, resolution fifth amendment to professional services agreement F002029 with Jessica Rasmussen. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you very much. Bringing it back to council. Are there any questions with the consent calendar? Seeing none, we will continue to public comment. Thank you, we are now taking public comment on the consent calendar items 13.1 through 13.3. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide a comment but have not provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for consent. Thank you, Vice Mayor Staff, can you please make a motion? I move that we approve consent items 13.1 through 13.3 and waive further reading of text. I have a motion made by Vice Mayor Stapp and a second by Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming is absent. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you. Um, and due to it not being five o'clock, we cannot have our uh, public comment on non-agenda matters. So we will continue to item 15, which are report items. Madam City Manager? Thank you, Mayor. Item 15.1 is a report item. Sonoma County Water Agency 2024-2025 water transmission budget and rate increase. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Mayor Rogers and Council Members. I'm Nick Harvey, Acting Deputy Director of Administration for Santa Rosa Water. I'm here to introduce Lake Jake Spaulding and Lynn Roselli with Sonoma Water, who will present the proposed water transmission budget for fiscal year 2024 and 25. Before they begin, I wanted to quickly review the annual process for approving the proposed budget and rates and explain where we currently stand in the process. After developing the budget and proposed rates, they are then brought before and discussed by the Finance Subcommittee of the Technical Advisory Committee in conjunction with staff from Sonoma Water. The process of discussing the water transmission budget and the proposed rate increase with Tax Budget Subcommittee was concluded on February 28th, where the subcommittee voted unanimously to recommend the proposed budget to the full Technical Advisory Committee. On March 4th, the TAC itself also voted to recommend the proposal, followed by a vote recommended, a vote to recommend rather by the BPU following the report item at its March 21st meeting. From here, each contracting agency will work with their representative on the Water Advisory Committee to coordinate how their agency representative will vote for the purposes of WAC's recommendation to the Sonoma Board, Sonoma Water Board of Directors rather, which is scheduled to take place at its April 8th, 2024 meeting. This evening at the conclusion of the Sonoma Water presentation, we request that City Council make a re recommendation regarding how it should direct its WAC representative, Mayor Rogers, to vote at that meeting. As a reminder, it's ultimately up to the discretion of, Sonoma Water, of the Sonoma Water Board of Directors to make the decision on how they will proceed, including setting the rate increases that will ultimately be implemented. All votes leading up to that point in the process are simply recommendations. Santa Rosa Water's current rate structure was developed assuming maximum wholesale water rate increases of 6%. After factoring in an anticipated 1% increase in water deliveries due to growth, as well as Sonoma Water's proposed 9.88% increase to the wholesale water rate, we estimate our fiscal year 2024-25 water purchase budget to be about $19.7 million. This figure exceeds our fiscal year 2023-24 water purchase budget by approximately $1.8 million. Santa Rosa Water's current rate structure includes a rate increase of up to 6%. As such, the remaining increase of about 513,000 
will be absorbed using undesignated fund balance. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sonoma Water. Thank you, Nick. Um, good afternoon, Council and Mayor. Uh, my name is Jake Spaulding. I'm the Finance Manager with Sonoma Water. Uh, and today I'm going to give you a brief overview of our fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget and rates uh, for the water transmission system. And at the end of the presentation, any questions you may have, both Lynn and I are available for, for them. Um, so each year we do develop a budget that uh, allows us to meet the water transmission system's uh, operations, maintenance, capital, as well as the regulatory demands that we have. Uh, this year, similar to last year, there is a heightened need uh, for infrastructure repairs and upgrades so that Sonoma Water can continue to maintain the system and operate it reliably 24-7. So just as a reminder, uh, the water transmission system has three main aqueducts, the Santa Rosa, which serves the city, the Petaluma, and the Sonoma aqueduct. Each one of the water contractors is, is located on one of these water uh, aqueducts, and per the terms of the restructured agreement, they pay the rate that is associated with that aqueduct. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the process, Sonoma Water is proud of the process that we go through when we're setting a budget uh, and our rate schedules. Um, you know, each year we bring a budget, a draft budget to the Technical Advisory Committee, uh, sorry, to the TAC budget ad hoc su uh, sub committee um, and then uh, we go through a pro transparent and collaborative process with them before finally bringing it to our board uh, in mid-April um, and we would like to thank not only Nick but also Jennifer Burke and Peter Martin for their participation both on the TAC and the WAC um, and as Nick mentioned that it was supported by the TAC. Um, just another reminder, you know, the, the water transmission system, it's not just one fund, it's actually many funds. Uh, the categories are shown on this slide here. Each one of these funds has its own budget and rate, and then those are combined to make a composite rate that the, that the contractors pay depending on uh, the re what the terms are of the restructured agreement. So Sonoma Water, uh, we do have a rel relatively robust water system, um, but we are facing several challenges that are not unique to our water agency. Um, you know, the first being that our rate uh, is stipulated by the restructured agreement to be fully volumetric. And, you know, why this is a, a challenge for us is that in the last five, uh, three, five, and ten year period, we've seen negative growth in actual deliveries. Um, you know, this was intensified during the historic drought that we had. Uh, fiscal year 22-23 was actually our lowest water delivery year on record, uh, with us selling just over 36,000 acre feet. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, we do have uh, aging facilities. Most of our infrastructure is 45 to 65 years old. Um, uh, a lot of it's expended most of its useful life. In fact, about 40% of it has only 10 to 20% of its useful life remaining. And not too different than owning an aging car, you know, both maintenance and repair needs do increase with age. Uh, in addition to the effects of age, uh, the system is also vulnerable to an array of natural hazards. Uh, primarily flood, fire, and earthquakes. Um, earthquakes are our biggest vulnerability in terms of both extensive damage to the system as well as service disruption to all the customers that we serve. And I'm mentioning them this uh, because the budget we're presenting today does include efforts to address all of these challenges. Um, so what's in the budget? On the capital side, uh, this year we've made a lot of progress on a few key hazard mitigation projects. Uh, and we continue to advance these projects to build both system reliability and uh, address vulnerabilities in, uh, to natural hazards. All the projects that you see on this slide will uh, serve the customers of Santa Rosa, but in uh, particular the collector uh, liquefaction mitigation, the pump and motor control center replacement, and the seismic retrofit of the storage tanks are all uh, either on the Santa Rosa line or uh, at our common uh, diversion facilities, which benefits benefits your constituents. Um, we have also been able to make use of about $10 million in FEMA grants in the last few years. And in fact, the water transmission system, I believe, has gotten about $26 million in grants in the last 10 years um, to fund not only uh, hazard mitigation projects, um, but other uh, capital projects. And we do anticipate continuing to seek additional grant funding, both from the, the federal level and the state level, uh, as we go forward. Um, in addition to those natural hazard projects, the capital budget also includes uh, other projects to increase resiliency in the system. Um, 
every slide you see or every project you see on this slide is also benefiting the city of Santa Rosa, but uh, in particular, you know, we would like to point out the, uh, the Santa Rosa Plain Wells project. Um, we were able to complete one of the three wells that's part of this project uh, during the drought. Uh, we were able to serve some water from it to uh, the water contractors. The remaining two wells that you see here, the Occidental Road and the Sebastopol, Sebastopol Pool Road well, um, are both in the budget in FY24-25, and we do anticipate that both will be complete by the end of that fiscal year. Uh, and this will allow us to provide additional uh, flow during future droughts. Um, on the operations and maintenance side, uh, we've highlighted a few of our high priority projects here, um, including a, a multi-phase uh, cathodic protection program um, that prevents corrosion in the aqueducts, a 10-year $88 million uh, tank maintenance, recoding, and rehabilitation pro program, as well as uh, the procurement of emergency inventory in case we do have a natural disaster. Um, these are some of our highest priority projects. It's, it's not a comprehensive list, um, but you know they're all important both not only for water supply but also for water reliability. Um, this fiscal year, we've also made good progress in advancing several uh, design on several projects, advancing uh, the emergency inventory procurement program, performing rehabilitation and replacement of sev several collector wells in the system um, for their pumps and valves, and also advancing the tank maintenance and recoding program. Um, and in regards to the tanks, you know, in addition to inspections, washouts, and minor repairs that we did on six tanks this year, um, we do have three tank recoats in progress. One is almost complete, uh, another one is getting underway, and one is under design and should be awarded before this fiscal year end and two additional tanks should be awarded in FY24-25, including the Ralphine tank for, uh, a Ralphine tank that serves the city. Uh, in the sub-funds, uh, which are for things like the biological opinion, uh, the water supply planning, water conservation, uh, we continue to work on the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project. Uh, we're making good progress on this project on phases four, five, and six. Um, and we do experience significant cost savings on this because uh, the U.S. Army Corps picks up 65% of the cost share. Um, in addition to that, Sonoma Water and the Sonoma Marin Water Saving Partnership continue to implement their robust and successful regional water conservation and education program. And that continues to attract a lot of outside funding as well, which helps us to leverage local dollars. Um, so what's in the budget? So as you can see on this slide, our total budget for FY24-25 uh, is $74.43 million. Um, this is offset by $18.13 million in grants, uh, use of fund balance, and bond proceeds. Uh, the total budget that you're seeing here is $6.14 million more than the previous fiscal year's budget, which is due to the transmission system's O&M and capital needs that uh, we talked about a moment ago. Um, you know, the operations and maintenance budget increase is, is really needed to fund the significant infrastructure maintenance and repair needs, and the capital budget is to push forward those hazard mitigation and other system reliability projects. Um, I did want to point out that the capital budget this year is fully funded by grants, use of fund balance, and bond proceeds, and that, what that means is it's not having an effect on the rate that you're seeing today. Um, and the sub-funds that you see up there with a decrease uh, that's primarily due to the use of accumulated fund balance that we were able to use to try and keep the rate low. Um, real quick, just to show you where our costs go, operations and maintenance are roughly 61% of our budget. That's followed by capital projects at 21%, the sub-funds, and then finally debt service. Um, so real quick, I wanted to give everyone a primer on how our rates are calculated. Um, they're done in accordance with the restructured agreement for water supply. And what that says is basically we take the cost of operations and maintenance of the system and we divide that uh, by the lesser of either the average of the last three years of annual water deliveries or the last 12 months of water deliveries. And when you do that calculation, you get roughly a dollar, uh, you know, a cost per acre foot. And this is a simplified example, so it's not, it's not uh, the exact calculation. Um, what you can see here is the lesser of the two is actually the 12-month figure. Um, that's what we usually would use, and that's what the water, uh, the restructured agreement tells us to you. 
to use. However, there is a, a clause in there that says that if because of drought or other um, uh, water supply conditions that we don't believe that that number is representative of what we will deliver, that we can deviate from it with WAC approval. Uh, Sonoma Water did uh, go to the WAC and recommend that we use the three-year annual average, and the WAC did approve that at their February meeting. Um, and what that means is that uh, if we had used the 12-year number, we would have been budgeting off a number that was 2.3% less than what last year's number was. By using the three-year average, we're budgeting off of a number that's 2.4% more, um, and that helps to bring the rate increase down because we've increased the deliveries. Um, you know, this is a, a calculation to show you how the volumetric rate really affects the cost per acre foot. And just to keep exemplifying that, um, uh, this kind of gives you an example of what would have happened had we used those 12-month actuals. Um, as you can see, if we had used the 12-month actuals, the Santa Rosa rate increase actually would have been 4.7% higher than what we're proposing today. Uh, alternatively, if we had used a higher number, like 44,500, and, and that, that is a number that we have reached in the not too distant past, uh, the rate increase would have been under 6%. So it's really, you know, this is an example to show you how much an effect the budget deliveries have on the rate increase each year. Um, you know, three years of historic drought, uh, mandated conservation measures by the state, they resulted in the historically low water deliveries that I mentioned earlier in fiscal year 22-23. Um, that led to low water sales revenues and it significantly reduced the fund balance reserves that we use to stabilize rates. So even with that 2.3% uh, increase in the budgeted deliveries that I mentioned by using the three-year annual average, because of these low reserves increasing operations and maintenance costs to keep up with the, the critically uh, needed infrastructure improvements and maintenance projects has led us to this point where we do have another elevated rate increase. We did make significant efforts to cut the rate increase as much as we could. Um, to do that, we worked with the budget subcommittee during that process I talked about, and we were able to reduce the rate increase for customers off the Santa Rosa Aqueduct from 14.57 down to 9.88%. We did this primarily by deferring $8.9 million in uh, lower priority maintenance projects, uh, trimming budgets, and using as much grants, fund balance, and bond proceeds as we could. Um, and as I mentioned, also using that uh, three-year annual average as a delivery number helped bring the rate down farther. Um, I did want to mention lastly, you know, we are using 2.25 million of our prudent reserve in this fiscal year's budget uh, in order to uh, ensure that we can maintain our three-month operating reserve in the O&M fund. Um, it's possible uh, that if we do have to, in fact, use this prudent reserve, that the WAC may want to replenish those funds in a future year, and that would lead to a rate increase in a future year. Um, so as you can see on this slide, uh, the rates for City of Santa Rosa, which are kind of in the middle there, uh, are proposed to be 9.88%. Um, the water contractors do have the discretion to set an, aqu an aqueduct capital charge um, each year. This acts both as a rate stabilization tool and also helps build fund balance for future year uh, projects on that uh, said aqueduct. The water contractors on the Santa Rosa Aqueduct did elect to keep their rate the same this year, which was $11. So this is uh, an example of, this is Lynn Roselli, Sonoma Water. Uh, this is an example Santa Rosa Aqueduct rate scenario, uh, long-range financial plan that takes into account all of the capital, uh, operational, and uh, other projects um, on the, in the system, um, and takes, looks at rates, grants, and bond financing, what scenario, what mix of those items are needed to actually fund the, the suite of projects that are in the long-range financial plan. And so this is uh, an example of what the rate increases will be based on certain uh, assumptions. Uh, it assumes water demand growth of 2% uh, for the five-year period uh, based off of uh, 2024 budget deliveries of 41,847 acre-feet. Uh, that 2% growth is probably a little bit higher than we've actually been seeing in the past uh, 
a uh, few five, three, five, ten years, uh, but we nonetheless uh, use that as an example here. Uh, we've estimated 9% growth in O&M expenses and 4% growth in capital projects, project costs. Um, there's $55 million more in projects that all of the water contractors pay for that, isn't on a, that aren't on a specific aqueduct compared to last year. Uh, and so this just is an example of what we would anticipate the rate increases might be given the assumptions that are here. Of course, if deliveries, we, we redo this model every year, and if the deliveries change, that has a significant impact on this model and the rates. And just, just to finish off here, this is a slide that shows wholesale water rates per acre foot for other wholesale water contractors in the Bay Area. You can see that we are on the far left side and we are uh, the lowest of the, uh, the five that are listed here. In fact, we're 31% below the lowest one, on below zone seven. And uh, we know this isn't an apples to apples comparison, but it nonetheless gives an example of, uh, you know, that our rates are uh, lower than our um, comparable other wholesalers in the area. And uh, also, um, you know, just anecdotally, we've been speaking with other, uh, with some of the whole water wholesalers, and they've indicated that uh, they may be increasing their rates by as much as 15%. So in terms of budgetary impacts uh, to the Santa Rosa water budget, um, again, our current rate structure without the pass-through for wholesale rate increases was developed to absorb a maximum of 6% increase for wholesale water. Given the 6% ceiling, the initially proposed 14.5% increase would have resulted in a total increase to the water purchase budget of $2.8 million, with $1.5 million of that increase being unplanned. The currently proposed increase of 9.88% would, would result in a total increase of 1.8 million with an unplanned increase of just over half a million dollars. In order to absorb the cumulative effects of these increases, as well as sharp increases in other O&M cost categories, Santa Rosa Water has proposed significant cuts to the year one funding of our CIP program in order to balance the budget. In terms of customer impacts, um, our rate structure is already set for next year with increases of 4% on our water usage and fixed rates. Uh, so our customers will see no additional impacts for next fiscal year. Our current rate structure is configured to generate between $520,000 and $530,000 for each 1% increase to our water rates. Between the current fiscal year's budget and our proposed budget for next year, our cumulative water purchase deficit or the amount by which wholesale rate increases exceeded the 6% provided for in the model is about $2.4 million. As such, we estimate that we need to implement an additional 4.7% water rate increase for next year to catch up on our water purchase budget. That only covers increases to the water purchase budget and does not provide for cost escalation in our other O&M budget categories or our CIP program. We'll be monitoring our budgets versus actual expenses and take these impacts into account when developing our new rates, the first of which is set to take effect July 1, 2025. Um, so what are the next steps? You know, we, we have been presenting to town councils and the water district boards uh, for this month of March. Uh, the next step is going to the Water Advisory Committee for a vote on April 8th, and then we'll take it to our board for uh, consideration on April 16th. Um, so uh, we also did just want to share these hyperlinks. Um, you know, Sonoma Water has made a big effort this year to try and do more outreach to the community uh, on social media and, and by other avenues. Um, we have put together a series of uh, videos on our infrastructure and what the agency does. Um, these are good resources not only for the council but for the public in general, and we've been trying to push this out as much as we can. And so, you know, in summary, you know, uh, our infrastructure, it's been, it's been gradually aging for decades. Um, a significant portion of it is approaching its useful life. Um, you know, we have pushed off a substantial level of deferred maintenance uh, for years to keep rates low, especially during the fires, the floods, and uh, during the pandemic. And we can't push everything out uh, any farther. Um, you know, because of the low deliveries from the drought, uh, we have additional pressure on our rates. And so, you know, we took as many measures as we could with the, uh, the TAC budget subcommittee to, to create a rate that we think is fair, um, softens the rate impact as much as we can, 
and allows us to, you know, be re responsible um, to uh, the system that we have a mandate to maintain. Um, so this proposed rate, is, rate increase is really needed to invest in the critical infrastructure we have and to remain prepared for natural hazards. And with that, um, I think we're open for any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for that presentation. I was telling Vice Mayor, I feel like I'm having deja vu, like you guys were just here. Um, looking to Council to see if there are any questions or comments regarding the presentation. Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 15.1. If you are in the chamber and would like to make a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one make the approach to the podium on item 15.1. All right, so um, Council Member Stapp, can you please make a motion? Sure. Um, before I do that, before I do, I just want to make a quick comment. Perfect. Um, thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the, the use less, pay more conundrum in which we find in which we're finding ourselves, it is counterintuitive for so many in our community. Um, we're seeing it obviously in the Sonoma Water uh, System and, and in Santa Rosa. In the same um, the same context is playing out with the groundwater with the groundwater rates. So we're going to have to find a way to message this. Uh, I'm glad that you emphasized in your presentation that we're not kicking all of our infrastructure projects down the road. We underinvested for too many years, and we're going to have to find a way to, to pay for those. Um, but it's simple, as your as your graphs made very clear, this is going to be an issue for years to come. We're looking at 10 plus percentage increases for the foreseeable future. Um, it, it, we're, we're going to have to find a way to message that. Jake, thank you for for providing those links. I know that Sonoma Water and the city are are, are both trying to find ways to get the word out and making clear to consumers what they're getting in exchange for the investments that, that we're making. Um, but obviously that's going to be a project for us for the, for the years to come. And with that, I'm pleased to make a motion. One moment. Let me come back to my, my notes. Um, I move to approve the Sonoma County, the Sonoma Water Budget and the proposed rate increase and direct the Water Advisory Committee, committee representative, our, our representative, our, our mayor, to vote accordingly at the Water, the Water Advisory Committee meeting on April 8th, 2024 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. A motion made by Vice Mayor Staff and a second by Councilmember Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Staff? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Going back up to item 14, which is our public comment on non-agenda matters. Uh, it is two minutes after five, so we are right on time. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to speak to the council on matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Madam Deputy, oh, Madam City Clerk, can you please proceed with public comment? Thank you. If you are in the council chamber would like to make comment on non-agenda non matters, please make your way to the podium if you haven't already submitted a speaker card. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. We will take up to 12 speakers under item 14. If we have more than 12 public comments on nine agenda matters, uh, the remaining speakers will be afforded the opportunity to speak on item 18 non-agenda matters. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. The first speaker will be Steve, followed by Marco, then Suzanne, or Susan. Uh, good afternoon, City Council. My name is Steve Harris. I'm a field representative for NorCal, Car <clears throat> excuse me, NorCal Carpenters, Local 751 here in Sonoma County. Uh, I Five years ago, I decided to become a field representative to give back to my brothers and sisters. The organization is the reason who I am today. It has changed my life for the better over the years. It has given me a career to provide for my wife and my three children. 
I have been in the construction industry for 36 years now. I began the journey by enrolling into the Carpenter's Apprenticeship Program, which has a duration of four years. And it, I had the privilege to learn on the job training and in the classroom with the certified instructors throughout, thanks, throughout the four years while earning a livable wage to support my family and be, get, being debt free of a student loan. Health care is something that was provided to me when I began this journey. Since my three children were born and have grown up, I realized the importance of having health care and benefits along with earning a livable wage. I believe anyone with a family can agree that having health care is a necessity. Over the years, I have commuted all over and have always wor only worked in close there. Over, I have only worked close to home a handful of times. I, had, I, I, I can personally speak on the triumphs and struggles that the construction workers face on a daily basis. That's why I believe that labor standard language for future projects and critical as type guidelines for developers to follow, like specific language, like guidelines for developers that a livable wage, apprenticeship, health care, local hire, would set the standards for developers when they come time to calculate in the project. In, conclu in conclusion, this is my question. How can we... Thank you. The next speaker will be Marco, followed by Susan, then Ruby. Start. Thank you, Marco. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor, Town council members and staff. My name is Marco Alfaro. I'm a field representative for the NorCal Carpenters Union Local 751 located here in Santa Rosa. I'm speaking here tonight to talk to you about ensuring the future of our construction industry and the community. There are a variety of factors that I hope you will consider in all of your future endeavors to lift up the local community. First and foremost is ensuring the men and women who are building your community are provided with health care. By choosing contractors that give this benefit to their employees, you empower the people building your community and give them the safeguard that we all need as a community, our health. On average, one out of four construction workers in California lack health insurance, which is two and a half times all California workers. That cannot be a statistic we see in our community fall into. As elected officials, you have the power to ensure that doesn't happen. Policies that require contractors to offer their workers family health care with raised standards in the construction industry, while also enduring that employers who do offer health care can compete on a level playing field. Another factor is hiring locally. All too often do our community members have to work two to three hours away from home, which in turn has them spending that much more money and gas and food in other areas leaving our town to miss out on that tax opportunity. As the state and the local communities look to reduce carbon emissions, local hires should be a part of any green or sustainable construction strategy. As more and more construction workers are forced into other communities, local hire policies can help bring the stability to families and the community, ensuring workers that can spend time with their families instead of spending hours and hours every day in traffic. Lastly, but most importantly, is the living wage. Ensuring our local workforce earns a living wage is vital to our community's success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Susan, followed by Ruby, then Matt. Do I just turn this on? You can turn it on, and then I will get you connected down here, too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Susan Lamont, uh, District 2. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this photo by Nick Utt. Widespread publication of it raised awareness of what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam, and it played a part in ending that war. Some of you may know this photo by Kevin Carter of a starving child being eyed by a patient vulture, which raised awareness about the famine in Sudan. That photo helped raise funds to alleviate the famine, which sadly is, is back again. 
I'm sure you've seen photos of dead and dying children in Palestine, but they haven't been enough to move you to action. Maybe you're numb, seeing too many dead children on our streets, can only muster thoughts and prayers. This graphic was created to remind us of that earlier famine. The vulture is wearing an Israeli star of David. Of pictures and photos like this, Susan Sontag wrote, there is shame as well as shock in looking at the close-up of a real horror. Perhaps the only people with the right to look at images of suffering of this extreme order are those who could do something to alleviate it, or those who could learn from it. The rest of us are voyeurs, whether or not we mean to be. Those of us who come here meeting after meeting refuse to be voyeurs. It is a moral imperative for us. Damn your supposed rules, which have been designed to thwart a compassionate response to horror. We know that people are threatening you. You can refuse to be threatened by them. All our cultural heroes have done that. Or you can sell your souls for the money and support that people, richer than we, are threatening to take away from your future campaigns. A ceasefire resolution may not make the change we want, but how can you refuse to join the growing chorus to try? I and mean, it's beyond my comprehension. I just don't understand it. Ceasefire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ruby, followed by Matt, then Ari. Ruby, no. Oh. Ruby, no. Oh. Um, Ruby Nunn Curtis, District 3. Um, I'm here to urge you to call for a ceasefire resolution. The UN just passed a resolution demanding a ceasefire from which the United States abstained. This signals to me that our government is in opposition to the rest of the world's moral objection to ceaseless slaughter in Gaza. It becomes our imperative then at a local level to stand for a, per a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. I would further urge you to consider divesting from companies that support the occupation and genocide in Palestine and Gaza. If you aren't willing to call for an end to the genocide, at least reconsider the ways in which we, at a local level, are complicit. I do not think indifference to genocide is a morally neutral uh, perspective or position. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Matt, followed by Ari, then Jason. Hello. Uh, yes, if you guys can look it up again from your computers, that would be fantastic. It's so disturbing to come here and have you guys just not pay attention at all. And if you can turn on the overhead projector, I will need it in just a few minutes. You guys said that uh, this needs to be a local issue for us to discuss this here, and this is absolutely a local issue. $12 million of Santa Rosa tax money has gone to this war. $12 million. And what would $12 million get us? Well, let's see. $12 million could give us 14,000 units for affordable housing. Well, I'm sure we don't need that. Um, $1,000 worth of free health care uh, for children. Uh, I guess we don't need that either. 130 teachers. We don't need that. My daughter is actually in a combined grade level uh, classroom. We could definitely use some teachers, but apparently that's not important either. And I would like to open this up. Oh, yeah. And then uh, we could handle some of the student loan problems that we have. And if you could turn on that overhead projector right now. So I would like to show you that some of us are really in high support of your campaigns. And so these posters will be hanging up around the city and you will see them. We are handing these out and we will end your careers because we're sick of it. Do something, say something, cease fire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ari, followed by Jason, then Gary. Hello. My name is Ari Vinyan. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. I'm also here to ask you all to please add an agenda item about having a ceasefire resolution in Santa Rosa. Albany just passed one yesterday. This is like there's over 100 cities in the United States who have already called for a ceasefire resolution. There is precedent. I do not understand why you won't even add this to the agenda when there is such large local support who keep coming out every meeting 
to ask for you to represent us, to even have a conversation. It's so convenient when we're in this public comment where you don't have to respond. You don't have to actually tell us why you don't think that Santa Rosa is a good fit for a ceasefire resolution. It's absolutely absurd. People are dying every single day. Children are starving. Families are starving. Why is it okay for them to starve when you are not? Why, why <laughs> can't we all be working towards a future that is not death for our world, right? The American public has overwhelmingly come out saying that we want a ceasefire. The UN is calling for a ceasefire. Why don't you have the courage to even add this to the agenda? I also, <laughs> related topic, really wish that we could have these meetings on Zoom. I know that white supremacists have messed that up for everybody, but it's also a huge disability rights issue, right? We also have workers out here who might not be able to come to these meetings, right? It creates access for people to participate. Do you not want your constituents to be able to speak? I think you do. I like to hope that you do. Please make these changes. Please add an agenda item for the ceasefire resolution. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jason, followed by Gary, then Tammy. Good afternoon. Hi, all. Um, Jason Sweeney, District 5. I, I uh, just have a few comments. I emailed the entire city council on March 7th, and I have only received one response from Victoria Fleming, just confirming that she had received it and read the email. So I just want to, I'm going to read these questions to you really quickly because I asked five questions that were in bold and underlined and the request was that I would get responses on these questions. How does the council provide feedback regarding non-agenda requests from the public due to your policy of not responding during the meeting? I got a little bit of clarification from the front desk, but that would be a response to emailed questions. Uh, would you please re 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 provide the reasons why you are not willing to bring forward any resolution on this issue, even one of your own creation? Are you, where are you getting your numbers from and why is this information not being made public? If, if there's some reason, if, if there's a number of people that are in opposition, if it is in, in fact a count, Please explain how the City Council has determined what is in fact the preference of the majority. Also, please explain Mark Staff's recent comments that passing the resolution would be a net negative. I didn't really understand that and I, I didn't get decent clarification from Mark. The last question, I think that was it. Um, I would just, so I, I also wanted to say, you know, we're, this has just been a frustrating number of months. A uh, number of city councils have, have stepped up to the plate and passed resolutions. So I want to read you a quote from this, uh, the mayor of Sacramento. This resolution is not about the Middle East so much as this resolution is about Sacramento. We are not at war with each other here in Sacramento. He added that the contested resolution had not created division in our city but rather expose the divisions that already exist. And we have an obligation as leaders, no matter what our walk of life, to try and make it better. That's what we're asking. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Gary, followed by Tammy, then Michael. I'm Gary. I'm a little blue in the face from saying so much, but uh, I'll try to say a little more. I know that I passed out flyers to all of you from a website, ifamericansnew.org. It tells the truth of how many children have been killed, how many children have no legs, how many children have one leg, how many children don't have mothers, and so forth. And you sit there calmly. I don't know how you do that. I highly recommend everyone sees the documentary, Five Broken Cameras. It's very basic. It's on CD. It reveals the desperation on a daily basis of these poor souls. And that's before the tragedy that's going on now. It's what they've been putting up with for many, many, many years. The uh, website, if americansnew.org, it has citations. I, I advise or recommend 
or suggest that everyone goes there so they understand what really goes on. Uh, the U.S. media is, is Israel-centric, so uh, they need to see the truth. Please call for a ceasefire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be Tammy, followed by Michael. Hello. My name is Tammy Joe. I am a longtime resident of Sonoma County and lived in Santa Rosa for many years. For months, many members of this community have been showing up to request a ceasefire resolution. Mr. Alvarez, after the last city council meeting, you attempted to manipulate us by playing dumb in regards to bringing a resolution to the table, claiming you were unaware of that process. Let me educate you. In the City of Santa Rosa City Council Manual of Procedures and Protocols, subject to agenda item B, place of items on agenda states, quote, Council members wishing to have items placed on a future agenda may take a request during mayor's council members' reports to add an item to a subsequent meeting agenda. A concurrence of one other council member will be sufficient to place the item on the agenda in accordance with the city council policy 000-35 early council agenda policy. Let it be known here today and on public record that we, I will no longer allow you or any member of this body to continue weaponizing your incompetence in this regard. I will no longer play along with your politics of empty promises, false respectability, and selective morality. It's about time to start calling out what we are witnessing. What I am observing in front of me is a bunch of facile bootlickers eager to please the inept chain of command, obsequious lapdogs of this amoral empire. Your ancestors, well, at least mine, are likely rolling with fury and sacred rage that you will rightfully see expressed through the upcoming generations. After 171 days of slaughter and genocide, your legacy of inaction and cowardice will not only not be forgotten, but will be duly noted by the and for generations to come. Cease fire now. Free Palestine. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Michael. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm from District 2 of Santa Rosa. I'm here to support um, a call for a resolution for a permanent ceasefire against the people of Palestine. Um, stop the genocide. I think all of us, every single city, needs to sign on to this. This should have been a pretty easy ask. I mean, it's not, it's all it's asking is to approve a resolution for peace. It's really not anything that should have been a big deal, but it's dragged out. And, you know, the UN is finally. Um, you know, put together a ceasefire resolution that passed because the U.S. abstained, um, which normally when a country abstains from supporting a genocide, that's a bad thing. But this is the world that we live in, and um, maybe there's a slight difference that's being made because people are finally starting to speak out. I'd love to see Santa Rosa finally do this. Um, tomorrow, Santa Rosa School Board is going to be voting on a resolution for a ceasefire. Uh, you should join them. Everybody should join them. This is easy. Um, so please join the call. Thank you. I see no one else approaching the podiums for public comment on non-agenda matters. We have received 10 public comments thus far under item 14. Thank you very much. We will now be moving to item 16, which are our public hearings for today. Madam City Manager. Item 16.1 is a public hearing, shared scooter system program ordinance amendment. If each team member could introduce themselves for the record.
Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. My name is Alexander Oseguera. Uh, I'm the active transportation planner for the city of Santa Rosa. Good evening, I'm Tarina Wilson. I'm the transportation planner for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, I'll be presenting on the scooter ordinance uh, amendment. So a little bit of background, um, the city council approved the scooter share pilot program in December of 2021, following a competitive application process. Um, the, the city awarded Bird Rides Inc. Uh, a pilot program permit. Bird flew in uh, the first 100 electric scooters on July 1st, 2022. Bird operated scooters in Santa Rosa until ceasing operations on August 31st, 2023. In January of 2024, staff met with representatives from police, fire, parking, the DAO, and the historic Railroad Square District, and all were in favor of transitioning the pilot program into a formal shared scooter program. In 1996 and 2001, the City Council adopted Ordinance 3249 and 3516, respectively prohibiting skating activities and scooters on sidewalks and streets within the specified downtown area, the specified uh, Railroad Square area, in shopping centers and on other specified areas of public property. The project includes an amendment to uh, the Santa Rosa Health and Safety Code Chapter 9-22 to allow for shared scooter system program. Um, the operations of the shared scooter system program would be consistent with state law. And just a little history of our shared scooter program, we had about 13,318 total rides during the time frame of the um, operation of the shared scooter system. And there's a couple other numbers in here that kind of jump out at you. 1.85 miles was the average distance. Um, we had a total travel distance of 24,697,000 miles. So chapter 9-22, the revision includes adding a subsection exempting scooters from prohibition to operate on public streets, public alleys, and public gutters, 9-22.020D prohibition. These devices will be prohibited from operating on sidewalks per the existing code. So it is the recommendation by the Transportation and Public Works Department that the council introduce an ordinance to allow all scooters to operate on public streets, public alleys, and public gutters by amending chapter 9-22 of the Santa Rosa City Code related to bicycles, skateboards, roller skates, inline skates, and similar devices. I now open it up for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. Are there any questions from council members? Council Member Rogers. Thank you so much. Uh, so as you mentioned, we started as a pilot program with Bird as the only operator. Would this amendment allow other operators to come in and sort of fill that space or fill that void? And if not, uh, could you update us a little bit on what those discussions look like? Yeah, so the process would be we would end up having to come back to you and have an amendment to our uh, permit conditions um, or I think maybe a resolution. So that would be the process moving forward. Um, and so I think the idea is to, to bring forward more the availability for more operators to be in Santa Rosa instead of just one. Good. All right. Uh, we'll now open the public hearing. We are now well, taking. Oh, go for it. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 16.1. If you are in the chamber, would like to make comment, but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes, and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium on item 16.1. I will now close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Are there any comments? Council Member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a quick question. I see that this amendment is actually for scooters and as somebody who 
probably shouldn't be on a scooter. Would this include us to be able to have like shared bikes or or a program like that? I know that that's something we were just in DC and there were scooters, there were bikes, there were a lot of um, electric little things that you could rent. And so I'm just curious um, if that would this language is inclusive of that. So I, as far as I know, there isn't any prohibition on bicycle riding. Um, so the bike share system should be fine. We actually have a program coming up that is a joint partnership between uh, the counties of Sonoma and uh, Marin. So um, we're gonna be implementing a bike share program in the near future, hopefully rolling out sometime late summer. Okay, thank you. All right, seeing no additional questions or comment, here. I just wanted to make a quick clarification and, and maybe staff can correct me that the, the ordinance is not attached to a share program. So this would be allowing the scooters to operate on the places that you talked about independent of any shared program. So this is a little different than the pilot. That's my understanding. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to make that clarification there. With that, I would just suggest that you um, open the public comment, um, open the public hearing and allow for public comment, given that clarification, and then you can go ahead and close. All right, we're gonna open up the public hearing again to see if there are any comments um, with the clarification, the language that was just presented by Madam City Attorney. And I'm seeing none, so we will close the public hearing. Um, and I will bring it to Councilmember Alvarez, I believe, for the motion. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to introduce the ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending Santa Rosa City Code, Title IX, Health and Safety Code, Chapter 9-22, Bicycles, Skateboards, Roller Skates, Inline Skates, and Similar Devices to allow scooters to operate on public streets, public alleys, and public gutters, and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion made by Councilmember Alvarez and a second by Councilmember McDonald. Madam City Clerk, may you please, oh, any additional comments? No comments? Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. We will now move to our second public hearing of the evening. Oh, sorry. Thank you for being here. We'll now move on Thank to our- Thank you for your time. <laughs> no problem. Our second public hearing of the evening. Um, Madam City Manager? I'm sorry, Councilman Alvarez is excited about the scooter program. Let me go to the next item. Item 16.2 is a public hearing, wayfinding sign ordinance and fee resolution. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers. Uh, members of the council, just quickly introduce myself and then hand it over to Christian. I'm Jessica Jones, Deputy Director um, of Planning here at the city. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, before you today is the Wayfinding Sign Ordinance. Uh, this is file number REZ23009, and this is to cover citywide. Uh, also, my name is Christian. I'm a city planner. So before you is the project description. So this is going to be a zoning code text amendment for wayfinding signage. Uh, before you are uh, different types. So this business wayfinding and public civic amenity wayfinding. And then there are provisional changes for standards related to these two. So that includes general standards, eligibility criteria, design standards, the application process, the removal of them, definitions, and then how the zoning code is going to be updated and then how this might affect transit hubs. 
So for the project timeline of this project, uh, this started off with Railroad Square Business Wayfinding Pilot Program. Um, they were given a temporary use permit for one year, and this allowed the city to go through the review process of how we might want to bring this and allow it within the city, because it is currently prohibited to have um, advertisement wayfinding. Um, then in September last year, the downtown received its own wayfinding sign program. This is permitted and we allow public and civic type of wayfinding in the city. And then we conducted a public survey from October 9th to November 9th last year. And then we brought the project to the Cultural Heritage Board for recommendation. And then we went to the Design Review Board for the same. And then we went to Planning Commission in February. And then before you today is the project. So I wanted to show what these look like as existing. So on the left are the business wayfinding sign programs in Railroad Square. And on the right are the downtown public and civic wayfindings that you will see around the city. So there are some definitions being added. Um, these are the ones that you'll see before you. So business wayfinding is being added, and then we're defining public and civic amenity wayfinding, sign plaques, sign post, sign header, iconography, and pictograms. Uh, two areas in the city are going to be allowing these type of wayfinding programs. That would be the downtown station area and the north station area. Um, these two areas were specifically chosen because they have uh, specific plans, and these specific plans specifically called out to have wayfinding sign programs in the future. So these are the proposed dimensions that are being proposed for the wayfinding programs. Um, and then there are additional information that is required of businesses for the business wayfinding program. So the maximum uh, signpost height is eight feet. The sign plaque would be uh, 12 inches in height by 24 inches in length. And then the font size would be two inches minimum and six inches maximum. And then this also has some additional font requirements for business logos. Um, so as I showed before, uh, the railroad square is existing as well as the downtown, and I wanted to show how they might be out of compliance and how they might comply with the proposal before you today. And then additional uh, photos of what the railroad square signs look like out in the area. And then there are nine signposts for the Railroad Square District. Uh, about 40 businesses are participating in this program, and there are about 110 signs in this program. Um, here are types of the downtown signs. Um, these ones are, uh, they, they can interchange. So some of them are color coordinated, and the white ones are for events. So those might change throughout the year as we see different types of events. And this program has 27 signposts, and some of them are front and back. So these are the general standards. So there is a three signpost minimum for the program. Um, this also includes public right-of-way standards, such as like for sidewalks. And then additionally, there are ADA standards, traffic standards, and zoning standards they would have to follow. Design standards, uh, we would allow walking time estimates. So this is if someone would want to know the time it would take to walk from maybe Courthouse Square to City Hall. That could be added to a sign if the applicant would like to. Uh, also prohibiting flashing and digital signs. And then directional arrows are required for these programs. And then the sign header is also a requirement. And that would need to display the area's name and imagery of the location. Uh, here are some business wayfinding standards. So we will allow six, uh, we'll, uh, proposing to allow six sign plaques per business. Currently, uh, Railroad Square only offered three per business, so they are within this parameter. Um, and then one public and civic amenity sign is required for business wayfinding sign posts, including iconography, logos, and then prohibiting business phone numbers, physical addresses, QR codes, and website text. For public and civic wayfinding standards, there would be uniform design, including color palette, font size, and font type, and then also including English and Spanish text, iconography, and directional arrows. For the application process, this is a list of all of the requirements that are required for each application submittal for a wayfinding sign program. 
Um, it is including location map, uh, concept conceptual renderings, color palette, font size, font type, iconography, pictograms, directional arrows, the sign flag header and posts, dimensions, materials, and then a mock-up to scale. Uh, additional changes a part of this uh, text amendment include for transit hub signs. Uh, we are looking at, as a city, we're looking into working with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and we'll be getting uh, different types of transit hub signage within the city. Um, and this is going to cover informational kiosks, maps, and other transit hub signage and wanting to differentiate between the wayfinding sign program and these types of signs. For the survey, this was open for a month from October 9th, sorry, October 9th to November 9th, and we had over 400 individual respondents. And then uh, this was broken down into a theme of common comments. Uh, this would be cost for the city budget and applicants, sign design, great for tourism and residents, promoting bike and pedestrian usage, city would need, should also receive emergency 911 polls, signs not necessary due to present day technology, remove all wayfinding signs, public civic amenities should be required and clear, uh, too much long term maintenance for these programs, code enforcement would need to remove all sandwich boards, and remove parking meters to promote walkability with wayfinding. Uh, as I mentioned before, we went to other boards and commissions before approaching today. Uh, we received recommendations from the Cultural Heritage Board on January 17th. Uh, these are the recommendations they provided and have been included. This would be each signpost should have a sign header indicating the name of the district. Uh, businesses should include their individual logos to showcase what Santa Rosa has to offer with individuality and culture. Uh, incorporating public and civic amenities should be a requirement. And historic landmarks should be counted towards complying with the public civic away, uh, amenity wayfinding requirement. On January 25th, we went to the Design Review Board and we incorporated their recommendations listed here. Those would be the sign plaque dimensions should be increased to 12 inches in height. A wayfinding so sign program should be a minimum of three sign posts, uh, creating specific sign program application requirements. A sign header should be required. Business logos should be allowed. Uh, public civic amenity wayfinding should be uniform in design and should be using pictograms as legally required. There were additional uh, recommendations not included from the DRB and CHB. Uh, this would be to ensure that this process is going to be at a ministerial process and not adding any discretionary level. So some recommendations not included are concept review by both of these boards, uh, sign posts would not need to match the character of the area and they do not need to match the historic character of the preservation districts. Uh, in February, we went. Uh, this project went to the Planning Commission, and it was through the public hearing process, and it was voted unanimously to by to be recommended to Council to adopt an ordinance. The Commission agreed with the proposed language and included keeping the process streamlined and ministerial, which means not adding any of the discretionary items as referenced before. Uh, as of now, we have received no public comment, and there have been no issues at this time. Uh, the proposed amendments have been reviewed in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, and this is exempt under the CEQA guidelines section 15060C2, um, and then not defined as a project under CEQA guidelines section 15378. It's also exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303 and 304. Uh, this would be adding signs to existing right-of-way, and then 15183, uh, consistent with general plan, zoning, community plan. Um, this is for under the Santa Rosa general plan, the North Station area specific plan, and the downtown station area specific plan. Uh, a text amendment has required findings. So these are the ones before you. Uh, that would be proposed amendment is consistent with the general plan. Um, the amendment would not be detrimental to the public health and safety. Additional finding of the zoning amendments would be uh, make sure it's internally consistent with the zoning code, and then it is also reviewed in compliance with CEQA. Uh, it is recommended by the Planning Commission and the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Council introduce an ordinance amending the text of Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, Chapter 20-38 Signs, 
to provide standards for wayfinding signs and section 20-70.020 definition of specialized terms and phrases to add definitions related to wayfinding signs and two by resolution establish wayfinding sign application fees. And if you have any questions, my information is also here. And I wanted to uh, note that the downtown, uh, sorry, the railroad square and the downtown groups are available if you have any questions for them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation and thank you for having uh, the visuals. It's really nice to be able to see a visual of what it uh, will look like. Are there any questions from council? Quiet group tonight. All right, so with that, we will now open the public hearing. Madam City Clerk. We are now taking public comment on item 16.2. If you are in the council chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Pardon me, two minutes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one make the move towards the podiums for item 16.2. Then we will now close the public hearing and I'm looking to council member Okrepke. All right, I'll move to introduce an ordinance amending the text of Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, Chapter 20-38, signs to provide standards for wayfinding signs and Section 20-70.020, definitions of specialized terms and phrases to add definitions related to wayfinding signs, and two, move to approve a resolution establishing wayfinding signs, application fees, and waive further reading of the text. I'll second. second. We have a motion made by Councilmember Okrepke and a second by Councilmember Alvarez. Council, are there any questions, comments? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you very much for the presentation. We will now continue to our third public hearing of the evening. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to look to uh, council members to ask about any ex parte communications, um, a disclosure. So we will start with council member Okrepke. Uh, I visited the site and spoke to two planning commissioners that have nothing further to disclose. We're just gonna go down. Yes, I have nothing to disclose. I spoke with planning commissioners and also the appellant team, uh, nothing to disclose. I went to the site. I also talked to a couple of folks who are opposed to the project, but learned nothing that isn't publicly available in the documents. I also visited the sites, uh, had written communication with the appellant, as well as constituents, as well as phone call with constituents, and have nothing to report that is not already in the public doc documents. Thank you. And I have nothing to disclose. Thank you. Thank right. you. Item 16.3, Verizon Telecommunication Facility Appeal. Okay, I'll uh, quickly introduce myself and then we'll go down the line here. Uh, Jessica Jones, Deputy Director of Planning here at the city. I also want to note that we have Gail Karish with BBK who is on Zoom. Uh, she'll be assisting us as outside counsel on this item. Um, we'll be available for any questions. Moving on down the line, I'm Susie Murray. I am the Supervising Planner for Current Development and here in support of the Project Planner. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and council members. My name is Suzanne Hartman and I'm the project planner presenting to you this uh, Verizon Wireless Telecommunications Facility um, Appeal. So a brief project description is that uh, this project uh, 
has a conditional, uh, apologies. This project um, needed a conditional use permit for a proposed 69 foot tall wireless telecommunications facility and associated ground equipment, as well as a design review permit. This is the aerial view of the project site. We have a motel area to the left or west of the site. We have uh, Costco and the shopping center that is south, um, an industrial use directly to the right or east. And then we have medium density, density residential and other various retail uses to the north. This is kind of just a zoomed in aerial of the uh, project site with the stars um, representing where the tower is proposed to be. The general plan land use designation is light industry and the zoning district is light industrial. This is the project site plan. And this is kind of just the site plan with a more of a zoomed view. And that site plan is also within the plan set, um, which is in the attachments provided. So just a little background, this conditional use permit and design review um, application was submitted of last July um, in 2023. And the Planning Commission approved the conditional use permit on January 11th of 2024. And the design review board approved the design review permit um, with two added conditions on January 18th of 2024. And then an appeal of the Planning Commission's action was received on January, 20, January 22nd. And the close of the appeal period for the design review board was on January 29th and no appeal was received for the design review permit. So in making sure that this uh, presentation doesn't drag on, I'm just going to um, stick with uh, calling out the responses to all of these grounds of, of appeal. So we'll start with response A. As noted in the general plan section of this report and in the draft resolution of approval, the proposed project has been found to be in compliance with the city's general plan, specifically while there are no specific goals or policies related to telecommunications facilities, these types of facilities have been found to implement a variety of overarching general plan goals by creating a functional place and for those who live and work within the city. Staff's response to ground B, as noted in the zoning section of this report, and in the draft resolution of approval, the proposed project has been found to be in compliance with all applicable sections of the city's zoning code. Response C, the proposed project has been found in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. While the appellant did not provide any specifics regarding the assertion of an environmental threat, concerns were raised during the planning commission meeting regarding the faux pine needle material entering into the adjacent creek and causing an impact. And it should be noted that during the design review board meeting, there was a condition um, that the telecommunications tower be proposed to be a monopole instead of Mona Pine, which would remove the um, foliage um, that was proposed. Response D. City staff has found this project to comply with the city's zoning code and we are not aware of any cons inconsistencies. Response E, the city's zoning code does not discourage proliferation of telecommunications facilities and encourages consideration of multiple shorter facilities. The code requires applicants to co-locate if possible. However, in this circumstance, the applicant determined that there are no existing wireless facilities where co-location can meet its service objective. And therefore, a new facility is required to meet rap rapidly increasing demand in the area. Response F, the zoning codes permit findings and telecommunication standards do not require demonstration of a gap in service, lack of capacity or a need for a new wireless facility. 
These concepts are drawn from federal law and court decisions, but apply only if a wireless facility is denied and the applicant files a lawsuit against a city claiming a prohibition of service in violation of the Federal Tele Telecommunications Act. Therefore, these concepts are not applicable to the city's decision. Response G. Federal government has largely preempted local government regulation in the area of radio frequency emissions, or RF emissions, making the Federal Communications Commission the federal agency responsible for setting nationwide guidelines for safe RF levels and severely limiting local authority to regulate RF emissions or to deny an application to install wireless service facilities based on concerns about RF emissions. And the federal law specifically provides that no state or local government or instrumentally thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions and the extent such facilities comply with the Federal Communications Commission's regulations concerning such emissions. Response H. There are no requirements for a fall zone or safe zone in the city's zoning code or within the building code. Response I. The city's building division has required, or sorry, has reviewed the plan submitted for a conditional use permit and design review and has not indicated any issues with the proposal. The next step for the project will be submittal of a building permit, at which time the proposed facility will be reviewed for compliance with all applicable building code requirements. Response J. The applicant has provided an analysis of 14 alternative sites for the necessary coverage. The applicant's alternative site analysis shows that the proposed facility is ideally located in an industrial zone near the center of the service gap and will be over 200 feet away from residences. I will also refer to the applicant for further, to further explain their findings with the alternative site analysis. Response K. The gap, again, the gap in service does not pertain to this appeal, and I will th let the applicant address their findings regarding the gap in service. Response L. The design review board was able to make the finding that the architectural design of the proposed facility is compatible with the character of the surrounding neighborhood and that the base of the cell tower and all related ground equipment will be screened from public view and placed behind an existing commercial building to minimize visual impacts as much as possible. Response M, the city's action on required permits are required to meet specific findings as stated in the zoning code and the findings do not include a finding regarding property value. Response N. The applicant provided updated photo simulations that show the proposed monopole at the requested vantage points. Response O. Again, the zoning code's permit findings and telecommunication standards do not require demonstration of a gap in service. Response P. Zoning code section 20-44.060, section B, or subsection B, directs that minor modifications to existing legally established minor and major towers in any zoning district shall require both minor conditional use, pen, use permit and minor design review. It should be noted that pursuant to section 6409, an increase in height less than 10% or less than 20 feet does not constitute a substantial change and therefore a conditional use permit would not be required, but it would however require, still require a minor design review. Staff finds that the project complies with all requisite requirements of the zoning code and that all required findings listed in city code chapter 20-52 can be met. It's permitted within the industrial zoning district by obtaining major conditional use permit and minor design review permit. And the installation of the proposed facility implements a variety of overarching general plan goals by creating a functional place for those who live and work within the city. The base of the cell tower and all related equipment will be screened from public view and the proposed height of the tower is necessary to maintain adequate height for function while allowing future co-location on the site. 
existing, the existing site is both developed and surrounded by existing industrial and commercial development. And the project included an EME report, which was prepared by Waterford Consultants, and which was received by staff on July 26th of 2023. And it concluded that the proposed placement of the tower at the subject site will not result in exposure of the public or excessive levels of radio frequency energy as defined by the FCC rules and regulations. Staff finds that the project also complies with all requisite requirements of the zoning code and that all required findings listed in the city code chapter 20-44 can be met the proposed facility is ideally located in an existing industrial zone near the center of the service gap, and it's well over 75 feet away from residences, as shown in attachment five. The applicant has provided a written explanation why the subject facility is not a candidate for co-location, and much of the monopole and great ground equipment will be screened from view by nearby buildings and trees, as shown in attachment 10. There will also be vertical space on the monopole for future co-location of antennas by other wireless carriers, and no new road or parking is required due to the facility being proposed and located at a previously disturbed site, as shown in attachment five. Verizon Wireless has submitted reports from a licensed engineer confirming compliance with the FCC's radio frequency exposure limits. In a radio frequency emissions compliance report prepared for Verizon Wireless by David H. Kaiser, electrical engineer, which was dated March 20, sorry, May 24th of 2023, it was confirmed that the radio frequency exposure assessment report to be accurate, as shown in attachment seven. And again, staff would like to say that the federal government has largely preempted local government regulation in the area of RF emissions, making the FCC the federal agency responsible for setting nationwide guidelines for RF safe levels. And the city has no discretion to deny a telecommunication facility due to concerns about exposure. The project was found to be in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to sections 15303 and 15183, which exempts the construction of new small structures and that telecommunication towers are considered small structures that are similar to this project. And the use is eligible for streamlining, a streamlining measure as it is consistent with the general plan of 2035, for which an environmental impact report was certified by council in 2009. So it is therefore recommended by the Planning Commission and by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council by resolution deny the appeal and approve a conditional use permit for a wireless telecommunication tower and associated ground equipment for the property located at 244 Colgan Avenue. And this is my contact information on the screen and if you have any questions, let me know. And we also have the applicant present um, to present as well. And if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. It was definitely a lot. So thank you for sticking, <laughs> sticking with this with that one. Uh, looking to council members to see if there are any questions. Seeing none. Um, we will now have uh, Karen Weeks, our Planning Commission Chair. Oh, well you were up there I thought earlier. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council. As you know, my name is Karen Weeks and I am the chair of the Planning Commission. As Planner Hartman indicated on January 11th, 2024, we reviewed this item and we found it consistent with land use and zoning code, uh, which is the Planning Commission's purview. And we were able to make all the required findings and approve the conditional use permit. It was a six, uh, 
vote, uh, one person absent. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But Looking to council to see if there are any questions. Seeing none, thank you very much for being here with us. Ms. And I'll Weeks. stick around in case there's other questions. Perfect. And we will now uh, open the public hearing. Madam City Clerk. At this time, Mayor, to follow procedures and protocols, um, we are going to call the appellant up for their presentation. Uh, so if the appellant can make their way to the podium and the staff member is going to pop open the appellant's presentation and advance the slides on behalf of the appellant. Uh, Sydney Cox and team is representing the appellant, so you will have 10 minutes for your presentation. Please go ahead. I'll give you a one-minute prompt, verbal prompt at the um, one-minute mark. Actually, a homeowner, and I live across from the proposed Verizon cell tower application. I'll be speaking out against it, summarizing three arguments, and then I'll be concluding with a couple of miscellaneous points. Next slide. The top three arguments, as stated there, we'll dig into. Note that each one of them on their own would be sufficient to reject the uh, basis of uh, the applicant's cell tower. And we'll take them each in turn, but all of them together pose a mighty trio. Next slide. The first point is that they have not established a gap in coverage. Next slide. Based off of their own map, as you can see here, this, these are all of the Verizon cell tower sites in Santa Rosa. There's some 40. That's not including 15 from AT&T. And as a result, we think this application deserves great scrutiny because there's considerable overlap. Next slide. That map that you saw started to look like a pin cushion, so it shouldn't be surprising. Santa Rosa has the highest concentration of cell towers in any other Bay Area community, bar none, per square mile. Within a two mile radius of the proposed applicant site, there are in fact 12 uh, additional towers. And those are the ones that are owned by Verizon alone. We're not including any other carrier. Based off of the current ordinance, you cannot place a cell tower within a two mile radius of an existing uncamouflaged or unscreened cell tower. So they failed on that alone, it should be rejected. Next slide. In addition, there's a failure of a gap in coverage based off of objectifiable data. They've given you self-serving maps. What they haven't given you are drop call lists or drive-by tests that would show any type of broadband usage. Those are objective measures that cannot be manipulated. And if you decided today that you wanted to postpone a decision in order to have real data in front of you, we would be in favor of that. Right now, they haven't done it. They haven't provided either one. We think you should reject it. Because if we were to ask the question, is there a gap? How big is it? Where does it reside? And is this application too much, not enough, or just right? You wouldn't be able to answer us, and that's the problem. Verizon's credibility is suspect on this. Next slide. Right now, they're speaking out of both sides of their corporate mouth. They're saying to you, there's a gap. They're saying on their own website, there's plenty of coverage. In fact, it's exceptional, shown in the dark red on the screenshot that's here. So who would they be fooling, you or the FCC? This is a form of commercial speech that's subject to FCC scrutiny, and they would be subject to fines for false advertising. Next slide. The next compelling argument concerns visual blight, which causes harm to the neighborhood. Next slide. The design itself is 69 feet tall. That's 30 feet taller than any other building in the neighborhood. It's out of character, it's ugly, it's intrusive, it's visually obscene. And that should come as no surprise because this project has faced considerable opposition because of its aesthetics. There's some 68 letters that have been submitted both to the Planning Council in combination with the City Council. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there. Next slide. The visual harm here can be compounded. If this is approved, they could jack up the height another 20 feet. So it's already a monstrosity becomes a leviathan. And unfortunately, the City Council would have no clout to reverse it. As staff has just stated, they'd have to come in for a design review, but they wouldn't be able to stop them from raising the height. Next slide. 
The mere imposition of this tower in the location would harm property values. And that's something that's well within your wheelhouse to protect. On average, cell towers that intrude residential neighborhoods drop the values by 10 to 20 percent. There's a study in the Journal of Real Estate Finance and Economics that was published in uh, February of 2017, along with the Appraisal Journal of Summer 2005, a seminal study on that. So this has already been proven. In the neighborhood, we have middle income, low income, retirees, people of modest means who don't have a lot to protect what modest assets they do possess. This would expand the economic divide. The proposed tower also would violate the general plan in what you would support as a livable community. It blights the visual view that we do have. It would also uh, undermine the general plan because the general plan seeks to avoid conflicts with, between land uses. We have light industrial and right across the street, nothing but residential. So you should take greater care in considering this application. Next slide. Verizon has also failed to mitigate what harm that they seek to impose in the neighborhood. Next slide. There are, uh, there's a three-pronged burden that they bear. One, they have to conduct alternate site analysis. Two, minimize visual impacts. Three, co-locate where feasible. In January, they testified that this was in anticipation of future growth along Kiwanis Springs. But the proposed tower isn't in Kiwanis Springs. It's on Colgan, so it makes no sense. And other options that they could have considered, like atop a hilltop where something 69 feet tall would be most appropriate, simply has been rejected out of turn. Verizon has failed to exhaust the numerous possibilities that it has control over, the 12 that already exist within a two mile radius. Nor have they camouflaged or screened or reduced the tower's height. They're stubbornly holding on to the 69 foot height. They also haven't acted in good faith or performed due diligence. In fact, they're counting on it. Let me give you a case in point. Their number one alternative was a T-Mobile site that they claimed didn't work out. You know why? Because it doesn't exist. On the corner of Colgan and Santa Rosa Avenue, there is no cell tower, hadn't been there for two years. We're not looking for phantom due diligence, we're looking for actual due diligence. They failed to live up to their burden. Next slide. I wanna comment on two side issues that do impact the application. Next slide, the shot clock. The Telecommunications Act added a shot clock to make sure that municipalities didn't sit on their hands or let applications die on the vine. But once you take action, whether that's asking for more information, whether that's rejecting the application or even approving it, that's considered action. You're taking that tonight. Once you take action of any sort, the shot clock evaporates. Next slide. Emergency chatter I've been hearing about. AT&T operates the first responder network, not Verizon. Adding a antenna would require AT&T doing so to affect AT&T, but it would only affect their customers. The bottom line that you should know about is that when anyone makes a 911 call, it is the first available network that steps in. It doesn't matter who it is, T-Mobile, AT&T, AT&T, so it is not dependent on this tower. Next slide. We ask that you reject it based off of these main arguments. However, I want to note for the record that only one resolution was actually posted to the website, the one in favor and not the one against, and I doubt that council, or that is your uh, staff, knows how you're gonna vote in advance. I just want that noted for the record. I'm gonna defer the remainder of my time to my colleagues. You have two and a half minutes remaining for the appellant. Okay, I just posted some, uh, put some pictures up there. That shows visual blight right there. I don't know if you can see it. I'm not, I don't have a camera here, so I can't use the camera. But I just wanna say, okay, there are the posters, and I also wanna point out another important poster, and I have something that I can show you later. I can actually make it available to you. This is the formula that v Verizon needs to explain to you so that you know what the FCC limits are. Does anyone even understand what this formula is? Here's an explanation about what happens using this exact formula when people are exposed 24 seven or eight hours or two hours, the exact formula from the FCC. That's the first thing. Okay. When I first heard about this tower, 
I thought there had to be some mistake. Right behind Costco, no way. I visited the neighborhood. I talked to folks there. I found an old friend. I made new friends. I really care about these people in Vintage Park and La Esplanada. One thing led to another, meetings, flyers, we hired attorneys, we spent money, we devoted months to our opposition. All along, thinking we had a chance to stop this crazy idea of a cell tower behind Costco across some seniors, families, and we filed an appeal. We saw the response from Verizon, the city resolution denying our appeal. My heart is confused and sad. What chance do we have tonight? If you deny the tower tonight, the shot clock stops. It should have already stopped. Write a new resolution. Verizon can always appeal to the courts, but maybe that's where it should ultimately be decided anyway. Thank you. Is that the conclusion of the appellant's presentation? You have yes. 30 seconds left. There will be an opportunity for the public to provide public comment. But we have 15 seconds remaining on the appellant. You have 30 seconds. I have 30 seconds? Okay. Uh, the staff mentioned several times that their hands are tied and that they can't do anything because of the FCC. I want to point out to you that many cities have a setback from cell towers, from residential areas that are 1,500 feet. Sir, that feet. concludes your 10-minute allotment for the uh, appellant. So, sir, what she's saying is uh, you can't finish right now, but during public comment, if you would like to speak, you can have two minutes to, to speak during public comment. Um, looking to counsel to see if there are any questions for the appellant. Seeing none, ma oh, Council Member Alvarez. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, question for the appellants. I'm sorry, it was a question for staff. I'll, I'll, I'll remind, wait for my turn. All right, so seeing none, Madam City Clerk. We'd like to call up the applicant for presentation and staff again will be uh, presenting the applicant's presentation and advancing slides on behalf of the applicant, Erin De La O and team. Again, you will have 10 minutes and I will give you a one minute prompt uh, at the one minute mark remaining. Okay. Staff, can you put it in presentation mode? Sorry, one moment. You're okay, take your time. Thank you for your patience. Let me get the timer started. Please go ahead, um, Mr. De La O, you have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Suzanne, for your presentation and thank you, council members, for being here tonight. My name is Aaron De La O with Centerline Communications representing Verizon Wireless on this project. I have four subject matter experts with me here tonight. Yvonne Pinto is Verizon's municipal engagement partner. Pablo Sanchez, Verizon's network engineer. Dave Cotton is with Waterford Consultant. He is an RF emissions expert. And Paul Albritton, who is Verizon's legal counsel. Next slide, please. 
This shows our application timeline. What I'd like to point out here is that Verizon has been looking for a solution to the network capacity issue since it was first identified in 2020. It took two years of hard work researching candidates, talking to landlords, and designing the site to get to the point where we could make an application to planning. We submitted our planning application in June of 2023. The project was later approved unanimously by the Planning Commission and then approved by the Design Review Board with the change from a monopine to a monopole. Next slide, please. Our application is for a 69-foot co-locatable monopole with Verizon's antennas at the 65-foot centerline, the ground equipment and tower in the 900-square-foot lease area surrounded by a 6-foot-tall chain-link fence with brown vinyl slats. Next slide, please. We prepared photo simulations taken from eight different vantage points, which are all included in Verizon's response to appeal letter, which is uh, attachment 23 in your packet. Our goal was to help refine our design and to show city decision makers and the community not just what the benefits of the installation will be, but also what the visual impacts would be. This slide shows the installation, what it would look like from across Colgan Avenue, which is where the Vintage Park Senior Apartments are. We did our best to obscure the installation by positioning it behind the industrial building to hide as much of the installation as possible. Next slide, please. This view was requested by planning. It's taken from Santa Rosa Avenue near the Redwood Inn. It's a very busy area. The site is hardly visible with the hills as the backdrop. Next slide, please. Uh, this view was also requested by planning to see what the installation would look like from the residences along Petaluma Hill Road. This view is actually looking west, not east from Petaluma Hill, just south of Colgan Avenue. Only the top part of the tower is visible in the distance. Next slide. We had Waterford consultants do an RF emissions report to determine the predicted public exposure levels, and the results are well under the federal limits. We have Dave Cotton from Waterford Consultants here tonight. He can answer any questions you may have on this topic. Next slide. Uh, we looked at 14 different candidates over that two-year time span, searching for the location that best suited the code and the needs of the network. This image shows the location of those candidates. You can also see the large commercial and retail areas and how the area is surrounded by and interspersed with residential developments. Our proposed location is shown as number five in green. It's not only tucked in behind industrial buildings, but also on the other side of the Costco building from the Costco parking lot and the entrances to the businesses in the San Rosa marketplace. Next slide, please. This is just a list of the 14 candidates we looked at and why they were disqualified. Some of them could not fill the uh, service gap. Some had owners that weren't interested. Some were too close to residences and would have, in, have had inadequate camouflage, so we discarded those as well. Next slide. The Santa Rosa Marketplace, well, this is an increasing, uh, an area of de increasing demand on Verizon's network. The Santa Rosa Marketplace has 540,000 square feet of retail space and thousands of visitors each day. Then there is Highway 101 with an estimated 140,000 vehicles per day and Santa Rosa Avenue, which is another heavily trafficked area. You can also see the residential developments that I mentioned earlier. All of these are important service objectives, and this high number of users is putting a strain on Verizon's network. To describe how this is affecting the network, I'd like to bring in Paul Albritton, Verizon's legal counsel, to take it from here. Paul? Good evening, Mayor Rogers, members of the council. Thank you so much for your time this evening considering Verizon's application. Uh, as Aaron described, this is a highly congested area for Verizon Wireless. We're experiencing growth rates of approximately 10% a year. We put that information in our letter, which includes a detailed RF analysis by our engineer, Pablo Sanchez, who's here this evening, which means that the service demands are doubling approximately every seven years. And this is a highly congested area needing, needing more service. Next slide, please. Uh, so from this slide, you can see we have three sites in the area. Uh, to the northwest uh, is our Roseland site, about a mile away. To the northeast is the Sonoma Fairgrounds site, and that's also, as you know, a location of a Red Cross evacuation center that's been used in the last couple of years. And then down to the southwest, uh, about a mile, over a mile, is the Dutton site. These are the three sites that are providing service into the area 
right now. They're over capacity. Uh, there is what we call a lack of a dominant signal because all three of those facilities are providing signal into the area and phones have difficulty finding a signal to catch on to and maintaining a signal. So we're experiencing low data speeds and drop calls. I want to demonstrate that in the next graphic if you go to the next slide. We're looking here at data from the Roseland site. That's the one that was up to the northwest. The upper red line shows the percentage of data resources used by that facility in trying to provide service into the area during a period from February 9th to February 16th of this year. As you can see, every day the site is maxing out in capacity in terms of its ability to provide data and throughput and voice to the area. At that same time, the data rates are dropping. That's a green line dropping, excuse me, red line, green lines at the top, red lines at the bottom, showing the reduction in data throughput every day, which is dropping down to almost two megabits per second. FCC defines broadband as 25 megabits. We're down to two, and so the network is, uh, from that Rosalind site is extremely compromised because it cannot keep up with demand. The next slide, please, uh, shows the same problem where we've got the Sonoma Fairground site, maximum capacity being hit every day from that period of, from February uh, 6th to 19th, and the throughput's dropping. So now we've got two of the three sites in the area. And then the third slide is our Dutton facility. Once again, uh, we've got capacity being reached on, on a daily basis and the throughput dropping. So we've got huge demand in this area from the 140,000 trips on Highway 101, the 24,000 trips on Santa Rosa Boulevard, the 500,000 square feet of business park, the 2,000 parking places in this area are sucking up the, the available uh, capacity of the Verizon Wireless Network. There's no issue here of coverage maps. You get signal, you get bars on your phone, but you can't get on the network and you can't maintain a call and your data throughputs are very slow. Next slide, please. I think the staff did an excellent job of reviewing the appellant's concerns. Um, I'll just briefly roll through them. The, the uh, general plan and code are clearly complied with. The Planning Commission, your staff, the Design Review Board all agree unanimously. I don't think there's any question there. Uh, the question of a gap I just explained. The appellants are concerned about coverage maps, and that's really not the issue anymore. That's the old argument. Uh, today, the gaps are with respect to capacity and trying to fulfill uh, the service needs. The comment on aesthetics. The Design Review Board was happy with the aesthetics. It's a slim line monopole hidden behind buildings in an industrial area. Uh, we fully uh, comply with setbacks. We're over 300 feet from the north closest home when we could be 75 feet, and we're at the back of the lot. Uh, we think the photo sims confirm that the aesthetic concerns are much ado about nothing. Same thing with the property value concerns. Uh, there are several cases that say any concerns about property values that are re related to RF emissions concerns are barred by federal law, and we think that's mostly the case here. Uh, and the 2005 study that's referenced by uh, the appellants is Dr. Cold, Dr. Gold, she's a New Zealand uh, scientist, who said that her, her papers are not applicable in the marketplace of the United States. They were related to uh, information from, from New Zealand. One minute remaining. Thank you. Um, they also commented on prolif proliferation of sites. I have to say, uh, Verizon Wireless has 14 macro uh, facilities and 30 small cells in Santa Rosa and approximately 42 square miles. In approximately 49 square miles in San Francisco, we have over 600 small cells and over 60 uh, macro towers. So Santa Rosa is far from being uh, over, overly burdened with, with wireless facilities. And what we're trying to do is provide service to meet demand. We have an excellent panel of experts. I encourage you to ask all of your questions. If there are any of the appellant's concerns that you think would cause you to deny this site, please ask us and we'd like to respond to that. And we'll, we'll end right there. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Looking to council to see if there are any questions of the applicant. <laughs> We're back. Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please conduct public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 16.3.
If you would like to make a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown, or pardon me, two minutes, and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. And if you have previously spoken on behalf of the applicant or the appellant, this is not another opportunity for comment. There will be a rebuttal period for both the applicant and the appellant um, after the public comment has been received. The first public comment will be Melody, followed by Michelle, then Roxanne. Hi, Melody is left. She was really upset. My name is Michelle Messino DeLuca, and I want to thank the folks who spoke on behalf of the, the, um, the appellant. Um, I'm speaking as a human being. I can't speak all this legal stuff. I'm speaking as a human being that lives right across the street. I hope and I say, I hope what I say will touch your hearts and motivate you to make the right choice. Our lives are in your hands. What is really most important here is people, not profits. This proposed cell tower is supposed to support people, but the location and the size of it clearly don't. The proposed cell tower will be way too large, nearly seven stories, which cannot be, ca cannot be cam camouflaged by buildings around it. There are no buildings anywhere near that height. Um, nearly seven stories tall and nothing approaches that height. It will be a horrifically ugly eyesore for everyone, looming large and threatening over our heads, in our views from our windows, doorways, patios, decks, and pools. Um, I have too many words here, so let me just say that although you cannot consider the health concerns, the American Cancer so Society says that there are um, some reasons that need to be investigated, and most experts agree in that. That leaves a community of elders, of which I'm one, plus other neighbors, pregnant mothers, children, and people living in the worry and concern for this, which should be your concern as well. We're the ones who voted for you. You also represent us and not just business interests. This could be very, very harmful for us. Please deny, deny Verizon's application. Let this council be a leader in safe cell tower construction as they are in Petaluma and many other places. This is just wisdom. This is common sense. Thank you. The next public comment will be Roxanne, followed by Mary, then Kim. Hi, I'm Roxanne Linius, and I live directly across the street from this proposed monolith. Um, it will be an eyesore. There's no way to camouflage something that's seven stories high. It's just a ridiculous idea. One of the statements the people that are uh, representing Verizon said that some of the places were declined, uh, re um, they declined to use the certain areas because they were in populated areas. Well, we live in a populated area. There are entire families in our area, not necessarily wealthy people. Most of them aren't. And that's, I think that might be, in the end, one of your considerations. You probably got the land a little bit less because of the area, but the fact of the matter is we matter too. No statements went out in Spanish. We have a huge population that's Spanish speaking. None of them even know this is happening. I have taught, uh, also the, uh, the notices that did go out, I've talked to many neighbors that said, oh, I threw that out because it was too small to read. All these things are happening as if we don't matter, and we do matter. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mary, followed by Kim, then E. Orlean. I have a picture to show. One, one moment. This one. This one. This one. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Mary Dahl. 
My presentation is in regards to the safety and welfare for all who live, work, or shop in the vicinity of the proposed micro tower at 244 Coglan Avenue. Kaiser Permanente listened to me and took proper action. Will you listen to me too? This was an ad advertisement of Kaiser's, a tender picture but deadly. Note cell phone, which omits extremely high levels of radiation, RFR. Infants and small children absorb RFR faster than adults. Kaiser responded gratefully to my letter pointing this out. They took immediate action. But we are not here today to talk about cell phones except they need all cell towers to function. The warning sign was placed about six feet on the pole with a simple with a single cell tower just 42 feet from my home. That was turned on July 2018. I fought long and hard to stop it to no avail. What rights does the city and Verizon have to be judge and jury sentencing one to a life of suffering without a fair trial? In 2021, I was diagnosed with ADA, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, a debilitating health condition that will never go away, but will only get worse, even when the single cell tower will be taken down. It is extremely hard to face physical sufferings, but, one, but when one is victimized by Verizon people, who get their way at my expense. That is so wrong. Safety and welfare of theirs is a joke. Verizon doesn't protect their subcontractors or workers with protective clothing nor turn. Mm. Thank you. The next speaker will be Kim, followed by E. Orlean, and then Richard. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Thank you for all you do for the city of Santa Rosa. A key point in our appeal is that Verizon did not adequately consider the coverage potential of using multiple of the less conspicuous reduced height feasible alternatives as explicitly required by the zoning ordinance. In admission of the insufficiency of their original application, just one week ago, Verizon submitted Exhibit D to Attachment 23 of the agenda. Verizon identified a number of new sites that they claim were investigated for location of their facility. Yet Verizon declares them infeasible because they provide coverage to a smaller geographic area. However, this assertion does not offer any qualitative analysis of the extent to which this smaller area still succeeds at providing services to a number of Verizon customers. More critically, Verizon entirely failed to discuss the possibility of multiple facilities of reduced heights as explicitly required by section 20-44.060F13. Verizon hasn't weighed the combined coverage of multiple telecommunication facilities of lowered heights, and they are required to do so. Verizon hasn't met the burden of proof for alternative sites required by section 20-44.060 to ensure the least potential impacts. Therefore, this application should be denied and the appeal upheld. Is the city of Santa Rosa comfortable with Verizon's claim that the single massive cell tower is necessary without providing objective raw data to support this? And is the city comfortable that their claims that no alternative locations? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be E. Orlean, followed by Richard, then Sydney, although I believe Sydney spoke on behalf of the appellant earlier. So, E. Orlean. Uh, good evening. Thank you for letting us have this opportunity to speak. I want you to know this is very personal. My husband, who worked at Sonoma State University for 35 years, the last 10 years, was faced with a cell phone tower on top of the science building across from the administration office where his office was, and he now has leukemia. I do not think this happened by some chance coincidence. The 
uh, in 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization, classified EMFs as a class 2B carcinogen, meaning possibly carcinogenic to humans. Many scientists on that panel wanted to name it a class 1A carcinogen, meaning definitely carcinogenic. California firefighters are well aware of this, as SB 649 exempted fire stations from cell phone antenna in 2017. This was a result of firefighters' illnesses linked to the antenna in their stations. The firefighters suffered from headache, insomnia, brain fog, getting lost in the same town they grew up in, sometimes forgetting protocol and routine medical procedures, mood swings, and infertility. In 2004, a SPEC brain imaging pilot study was conducted on California firefighters who had lived in the shadow of a tower for over five years. The study conducted by Gunnar Heuser, MD, PhD, found brain abnormalities in all six men, including delayed reaction time, lack of impulse control, and cognitive impairment. If we care enough about firefighters' health, what about the rest of us? We do not consent to be guinea pigs in this experiment on our health and lives. I have written a book about 5G, which I'm going to give to you as a gift that has two chapters about all the health impairment. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Richard, followed by April, then Jennifer. Richard. Uh, yes, I'm Richard Boyd, a uh, retired physics professor, and as such, uh, I could not resist trying to understand how Verizon got its estimates of the radiation limits. Thank you. Uh, so I, I took the equation, uh, the massive thing that uh, Sidney Cox showed, and uh, uh, reduced that to something that was more salvageable. So for starters, uh, they gave uh, the, the radiation level a ground, ground level. We're not really interested in that. Feet are pretty impervious to radiation of any type. What we're interested in is, is what is it five and a half feet in the air? Brains are very sensitive to radiation. And it's virtually impossible to tell that from the, the Waterford estimates, although it's clear uh, that the radiation level increases with altitude. So how much will that increase the 11.8% of the FCC limit? I don't know, but it, it would certainly be appreciable. Uh, another thing, uh, there are a lot of other uh, cell towers in the area, and I don't believe those were included in the calculation either. They certainly contribute something. Uh, Verizon reported no dropped calls, so we know there is uh, plenty of radiation to run cell phones in that area. Uh, so how much this would add to it, uh, I don't know, but, uh, you know, another significant chunk. Uh, finally, there's an effect that uh, Verizon probably doesn't know anything about, uh, and this is scattering. Uh, it's a standard physics problem, though. Uh, the radiation will scatter from any objects that, are, that e exist in the area, and uh, that can be a big effect. And, uh, and, and so that needs to be at least estimated, and Verizon could do that with a, a simple simulation. Uh, why do I say all this? Uh, I th I'm just trying to present that there is some serious chicanery going on. Thank you. The next speaker will be April, followed by Jennifer, then Alex. While I understand the financial gain by putting the 69 tower behind 69 foot tower on Colgan behind Costco and Target, not enough people have looked into the imminent harm of 5G towers emit into the atmosphere. These towers are harmful to humans, plants, and animals. There is a care home around 250 feet away from the proposed site. Some of the side effects, but not limited to, are headache, insomnia, cognitive fog, fatigue, vision problems, heart issues, flu-like symptoms, muscle, nervous symptoms, problems, pro-inflammatory pathways. I personally suffer daily from debilitating migraines that interfere with parenting and life. 
please do the entire research on the harm before making a final decision. They do lower the price of homes and there is much information on the NIH.gov website. They're not making our cell phones faster or more efficient. In fact, most people know to a slower connection speed. I cannot live without having an EMF thing in my pocket because it is so debilitating and I hope that you'll look further into it before making a decision. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jennifer, followed by Alex, then Paul. Okay. Um, fact, there are no safety standards. Currently, there are no national or international set standards for safe levels of the radiation emitted by wireless or microwave devices. As stated by the FCC, there are no federally developed safety standards. After years of a robust research effort by U.S. agencies, the U.S. EPA was tasked to develop proper safety standards and was developing two-tiered guidelines on both thermal and biological effects. Then in 1996, it was defunded. Hmm. Instead of proper safety limits, the U.S. government adopted guidelines developed by industry based on decades of old research. Guidelines have a much lower certainty than a standard as proper long-term safety testing was not done to ensure the public was protected. In fact, no safe level has been scientifically determined for children or pregnant women. Therefore, the claim that a device meets FCC standards or that radiation levels are FCC compliance gives a false impression of safety. Um, look, the FCC is run by industry insiders and doesn't have a single scientist on board. Their 1996 emission guidelines were found to be outdated by a U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit on 8-13-21, yet the FCC has refused to update them. Their guidelines are not based on any biological effects, people, only thermal effects. The U.S. has some of the highest emission guidelines in the world. The precautionary principle is a scientific term for common sense that requires holding off on any new permits until the new guidelines are in effect. Enough is enough. Santa Rosa already has 40 cell phone towers, and right now there are more in the works. There's an application for another macro tower at 2715 Giffen off Corporate Center Parkway, adjacent to a residential. Thank you. The next speaker will be Alex, followed by Paul. Hi, I'm Alex Crone, born and raised in Santa Rosa. I'm a physical therapist. I work hard and co contribute to this community, raising two young children. First of all, I'd ask you tonight to do the right thing. Don't do the thing uh, which is clear that you're probably afraid to be sued by Verizon in this situation, okay? First of all, what's Verizon's new business? It's streaming services. Sign up for Verizon, pay five extra dollars a month, and you get to Netflix, free Netflix and other streaming services. So these cell towers, less than 1%, per I'd guarantee, or I'd bet, of the RF radiation and the power coming off these is actually for phone calls and for text messages like the, the 1996 Telecommunication Act was probably referring to, not video streaming services. They've given you zero objective numbers or data to prove that there is a gap in service um, and there's any problems with phone calls or text messages. They're looking to stream videos here. They gave you one, I think, attempt tonight, the first slide I've seen. They first gave you just these colored maps, which meant nothing. Um, that was, ref they, they showed you some red and green lines and some numbers on there, and it was just for 700 megahertz, but they're putting six other different frequencies and 12 antennas on these towers, so, so where's the, the objective data for, for those? They already have another provider going to co-locate and add probably 12 more antennas to that pole. They, they said that in their documents. They told you that a gap in service doesn't apply here. Um, because of the ordinance. And what's that, what that's really saying is your, your city ordinance is so weak that we can basically put a macro tower in any industrial zone we want. And that, that doesn't seem right. The FCC is the most captured agency. 
Um, I hope you know what that means. Um, please ask the engineer how they determine the safety standards. I'd like to know. Talk about the, the pulsation and the polarization and how you measure it. Is it average or is it on the peak levels of radiation? Thank you. The next speaker will be Paul. I'm an urban environmental planner. The staff kept telling you that they couldn't do anything. Uh, you know, in fact, there are many cities in California that have large setbacks between residential zone land and cell towers, sometimes up to 1,500 feet, and many other uh, requirements uh, that would, if, if Santa Rosa had this, you wouldn't have even have seen this uh, application. So my suggestion is that to strengthen your telecommunications ordinance before the entire city becomes a pincushion with many more cell towers than what we really need. And the cities that have strong cell tower, cell telecommunications ordinances also have excellent cell phone reception. So that we don't need this high intent and intensity. And um, the other point I want to make is that uh, we submitted a 26-page rebuttal uh, and in support of our uh, appeal. It doesn't seem that staff took many of these points and uh, told you what they said. I don't know if you've even read this. We, had, we hired a telecommunications attorney uh, to prepare it, and uh, I trust that you would take this into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite anyone else remaining who would like to provide public comment to make your way to the podium. You are not required to submit a speaker card. If you've already spoken on behalf of the applicant or the appellant, you will have an opportunity for a rebuttal or closing comment. Mayor MC, no one else from the public wishing to provide public comment on item 16.3 thank you so with that we will invite the applicant for a rebuttal or concluding comments um, and you will have five minutes good evening Paul Albritton outside counsel for Verizon Wireless again thank you for your time I'll just cut, touch on a couple of issues I think you know that once we've demonstrated with our outside professional engineer that we comply with the FCC standards, that that takes it off the table as a decision point for the city of Santa Rosa. That doesn't mean that we don't take that issue seriously, and we do. I have in the, in the 40 years that I've been representing wireless companies, it's been an issue. Um, and, we, and we do take it seriously. Um, the, the World Health Organization, the American Cancer Society, the EPA, the Food and Drug Administration, and indeed the FCC have all concluded studies and confirmed that there's no direct correlation to the health effects that are being described from RF uh, emissions. The FCC renewed its uh, review of this standard as recently as 2019. Um, and Verizon, of course, cares about people. Um, I'm sure you're aware that uh, all wireless alerts comes through, through wireless phones these days. That's part of FCC uh, and federal mandate. The city of Santa Rosa itself has over a thousand Verizon wireless lines amongst its police department, fire department, and city that are used for responding every day to emergencies. Uh, I, I don't want to personalize it, but I lived in Fountain Grove in 2017, and it had, had it not been for my Verizon wireless phone, I would have not known to evacuate at that time. So Verizon does care about people, and this is incredibly important for them and for your community, this type of emergency response and just the simple daily communications uh, between communities. Uh, with respect to some of the other issues, there was a suggestion that we should have more, more small cells, more smaller facilities. As you already know, we already have 30 small cells. We need to complement the macro towers with the small cells in order to create an efficient network. Verizon's doing everything it can to create an efficient network to provide the coverage and capacity that's needed by the community. They have no interest in overexpending on infrastructure to make that happen, uh, and, and will continue to do so to provide reliable service uh, in Santa Rosa. 
There was a comment about a state law that excludes firefighters that was misrepresented. That law only applies to uh, deemed approved remedy for a modification of a facility, and it clearly says that the fire departments need more time to, to determine the accessibility to their facilities before you can deem an application approved in 60 days, and the industry agreed with that, and that's how it ended up. Uh, there was discussion about streaming, video, and so forth. All wireless services data these days, Verizon uses its voiced over LTE, which is a data voice service, and is its primary objective is to provide uh, voice services. There may be some confusion with the Verizon's FG, 5G home service, uh, which is uh, entirely different. I do want to say, I think you know on the federal law side, and I know you've got a federal legal expert on the line here, you need to have substantial evidence to deny a wireless facility. That means you need to have facts that match with your code or law in order to deny a facility. For example, a setback, we comply with the setbacks. If we didn't, that's the kind of evidence you need to deny a wireless facility. And finally, we went out of our way in showing a gap, and that was to also meet the federal requirement that if we show that there's a significant gap, and this is the least intrusive means of filling that gap, that we meet the federal requirement, uh, that the, the site should be approved in order to avoid a prohibition of service. Uh, and we would, of course, we submit that information to also create a case that will allow us to defend the city in the event of any litigation uh, sub subsequent to any approval of the facility. We brought all these great experts here. If you have any questions, please ask. But we very much appreciate your time and uh, patience this evening in reviewing this application and encourage you to affirm the decision of the Planning Commission, the Design Review Board, and your planning staff to allow Verizon to catch up from 2020. One minute remaining from 2020 to provide uh, the capacity and service uh, to serve your community. Uh, we're open to any questions. Thank you. We will now call the appellant for a rebuttal or concluding comments, and you also will have five minutes. Thank you for um, allowing us to have another response. Would you like to respond also? Okay, if we only have five minutes total, I'll let um, Carmen speak first. Thank you. I find it ironic that uh, Verizon claims you need facts to decide, but yet it withholds those facts that you need to make that objective determination. You don't have the drop call list. They haven't even told you, for example, of the 12 towers that they do have, what percentage could be co-located in order to overcome this gap that they claim is there. Is it 30% of this tower, maybe 50% of that? They don't say. And even of the other uh, respondents that they looked to, there were two that they didn't even follow up on that hadn't given them an answer. I, I just find that there's a substantial lack of due diligence, and that's actually required by the law. That's not a do it if you feel like it. They overstate their claim, and they misstate their claim at the same time. They're saying that you know it's more than 300 feet away. It's not. We actually pulled out the Google Maps. You could do it yourself. It's 260 feet away from the nearest uh, resident. And where you have a tower, this proposed tower, to be on private property adjacent to a service area, um, road or an alleyway, it has to be camouflage. It has to be screened. That's what the ordinance says, and they don't do that. They're, again, they're stubbornly holding on to a 69-foot tower. I will add that you're going to see a film called Groundhog, but it's going to be in the form of the topic of cell towers because on Thursday, the Planning Commission is taking a look at another proposal at 2715 Giffen, with the very same dimensions, a 69-foot monotone pole, and it's two miles away from this intended site. They are looking to just poke us like a voodoo doll. Let's, enough is enough. There are three minutes remaining for the applicant concluding comments. I have another minute, another minute? You have three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanna say something about the fires. We had the fires, of course, and um, our, my, I have a Verizon phone. I hardly ever turn it on. Um, I did not have cell service at my home. So uh, the fact that the, the Verizon network worked during the fires, well, you know, landlines. Landlines work the best. I also want to say um, zoning code 20-10-020 to fulfill the purposes 
It is the intent of the zoning code to A, provide standards for the orderly growth and development of the city and guide and control the use of land to provide a safe, harmonious, attractive, and sustainable community. B, implement the uses of land designation by the Santa Rosa General Plan and avoid conflicts between land uses. C, maintain and protect the value of property. E, protect the character and social and economic stability of residential areas. And that's from your zoning code. Thank you. Uh, we'll close the public comment. Close sorry the about public that. hearing. Close the public hearing. Oh, oh Mary. sorry. I will close the public hearing. And looking to council to see if uh, there are any questions. Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first, to, to staff, on page 14, uh, the applicant has provided a written explanation why the subject facility is not a candidate for co-location. Is this information that was provided by the applicant but not validated by the City of Santa Rosa staff, or do we actually look at their, their explanations and then confirm and validate? So I'd say um, thank you for that question, um, mm -hmm. Council Member. So um, the city uh, does review all uh, materials that are submitted to the, to the city. Uh, we do not have um, expert staff on board. Um, uh, we do take a look at, at uh, everything that they have provided. If if we uh, look at that in consultation with our city attorney's office and other departments within the city, and um, we have any concerns, we do uh, we would tend to ask for um, additional information information or um, a, uh, a peer review potentially. Uh, my understanding is that there was uh, two entities that looked at this, if I, Suzanne, is that correct? Yes, yeah. Two went, sorry, can you say that, it, repeat your So question. I think we've got the, the engineer that wrote it and then there was somebody that followed up with a, with a confirmation. Yes. Yeah. Would you be able to provide who those entities were that, that confirmed or, or validated that information? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Who validated or confirmed that information? So I think those are in the attachments. Suzanne, can you bring those up? And, and in, in the meantime, um, when it comes to information, and, and it seems that whether it be the, the, the levels of produced by these antennas is information that the city, according to what I'm reading in my, in my documents, is something that we simply don't look at when the termination of these, of these projects. Is that correct? So I think um, I might want to bring on Gail um, to help with, um, you know, how, what the city's review is. Our limitations, the, so to speak. Yeah. And specifically on page 15, the city has no discretion to deny a telecommunication facility due to concerns about exposure. So Gail, can you help out with that one? Yes, I, I can. And, and uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and, and council members. Um, I hope you can hear me uh, just fine. Um, so uh, it is uh, a long established uh, federal law actually dating from 1996 that uh, places those limits on local authority to consider um, RF emissions exposure uh, in uh, their uh, either in development of uh, regulations or in uh, individual applications um, to the extent that uh, the applicant demonstrates that there is compliance with the federal standards. And I just want to correct something uh, that was mentioned by one of the speakers. There are existing federal standards that the Court of Appeal, the D.C. Court of Appeal did not um, throw out FCC standards. They, um, they did uh, oh, uh, ask the FCC or remand a decision of the Federal Communications Commission when, uh, that, where the commission uh, terminated an inquiry that it had started uh, about updating the standards. So the standards that were developed by the FCC are still 
uh, out there and required to be complied with by um, applicants. Applicants uh, typically submit an, an expert report um, demonstrating compliance. Sometimes cities uh, hire an expert to uh, do a peer review of that report. Some cities don't do that. Um, but uh, once, uh, if, if the evidence in the record is that uh, the proposed facility is going to comply with the FCC standards, and that's sort of the end of the matter in terms of uh, regulating uh, the, or making a decision on the application based on RF emission standards compliance. Very well. And I appreciate that, that answer. Uh, did we find the information to the first question I posed? Yes. Sorry, it took a second. Um, it's found in attachment 11. Um, it's OKU Solutions is the company that proofed the uh, report. Um, it's signed by David Wutowski, and the um, original report was uh, signed by David H. I think it's Kaiser or Kisser. Um, who's a certified electrical engineer for Waterford LLC. Are any of the representatives here today for questioning? Yes. Perfect. Sir, could I pose the question to you, sir, if you'd like to, if, through the mayor? May you please approach the podium, sir? I'm Dave Cotton, uh, professional engineer. From, I represent Waterford Consultants. Uh, David Kaiser was my colleague there. Thank you for, for being here, sir. I, I see that you also have the legal counsel of Verizon next to you. So I imagine that you have represented Verizon in the past, or are you an independent entity who works uh, for both as a, as a subject expert for the city or just a subject expert for Verizon? We have represented not just Verizon, but the other wireless carriers as well. Have you ever represented the city of Santa Rosa? No. Very well. That's all, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, moving forward, uh, in regards to the font notifications that were sent out to the neighbors, or at least the, the, the notifications that were sent out, uh, what were they? So I believe it was in reference to the notice of, well, there was first in order, it was the notice of application, and then about, I would say, two weeks uh, later was the notice of public hearing. Um, I do think there may have been confusion between the two because one obviously addresses and provides the information for the meeting um, and the other does not. Um, but both were sent out uh, prior towards the meeting, and I think that, I believe it's 10 days prior towards the public hearing, and they were both duly noticed. Um, I also want to uh, also call out that, sorry, I'm just pulling up. We also, um, the city received, because we received several comments, um, we also provided an additional notice um, with a larger font uh, prior to the, I believe it was the January 18th meeting, uh, Design Review Board meeting, um, to accommodate the uh, responses about the uh, s small font. Um, if, I don't know if anybody else here has anything to add to that. We have a, a standard size font and I believe it, it ranges between 10 and 12 in the font size. Um, and again, as Suzanne said, we did send out a courtesy notice. It wasn't required just to address the, the large font size. But that's a font size that we use for all of our noticing citywide. Very well. Were any of the notices uh, sent out in any other language other than English? Uh, no, there was uh, no notice sent out in any other language, and there was also no request for a Spanish translation for those notices as well. I appreciate that. And what is the current required setback for these towers in residential areas? The uh, tower is required to be at least 75 feet away from any habitable structure. Um, and on the plan set, um, it does show that the nearest habitable structure, I believe, is it's going to be well over 100 feet, I think. 
Yeah, I, I think, sorry, let me pull up the plan set to just confirm, but I believe from the uh, housing across the street um, facing north, it was about 321 feet away. And from the, I don't think there's an exact uh, measurement from the neighboring motel, um, but they do measure uh, the building that's also, that's still on the same property from each corner, essentially, and that's at least 130 feet. So the, it's gonna be well over 150 feet from the motel. No, I know that we're definitely an exception to many of the rules, uh, but I'm wondering of regional cities, uh, other cities here in the state of California, is, is there like an average setback that we've seen, or is it simply just city by city, uh, entity by entity? I think it's by city, but I'm not 100% sure. Or is there, is there a minimum set forth by the state of California, maybe? I don't know if there's a minimum setback. I would defer to our outside counsel um, on that, but we have not done any research um, to date on uh, the average setback to other jurisdictions. Certainly um, information that we can be ready for next time, but I will, like I said, defer to counsel um, on, uh, I don't know if she's aware of any average setbacks um, or if there's anything in state or federal law. Thank you. Uh, I'll reserve for, actually my last question, uh, shot clock, what does that mean? It, it's a, it's it, it's the allowable time for review. So typically, these have to be reviewed. I think in 150 days for 160. the 160 yeah. days for the entire review. And in order, and if we don't complete the review in that period of time, they are deemed approved. Um, the I'm I'm going to defer to the applicant why, but the um, applicant has been very agreeable in extending that up into this this time for to accommodate the appeal. Very well, so. and that was 150 days from the submission of the project or the review process, which is also the submission of the project, not the appeal process, not any of the other uh, process in in. in it's upon submittal Very of the well. application. And I'll reserve further questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. I, I believe, I, I can't answer that question. I believe that someone was approaching the dais to explain the shock. No, actually, no, I'll reserve. I, I, the, the answer that you gave me was sufficient. I appreciate it. Ma'am. Ma'am, I'm unable to allow you to do that. Um, Council Member Rogers. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that uh, some of the uh, appellants had that the applicant sort of responded to was about why 69 feet, uh, why does it have to be bigger? Why couldn't you achieve the same level with less intrusive uh, cell uh, technology, uh, particularly that could be uh, better hidden or maintained. Could you talk a little bit about what that discussion looked like on our side, particularly for the city? How do we make that determination that it's sufficient for them to do one giant tower as opposed to something that is lower, smaller? So yeah, so it's, it's really, we defer to the applicant. That's why we require all the information on um, the analysis that they have done on looking at alternative sites, coverage gaps um, to determine what is necessary to meet their needs. Um, and uh, we rely on that information that they have provided. Was there any discussion about that at the Planning Commission? Sort of looking over at the Planning Commission chair? Yes. Can you ask me again, Chris? Sorry. Yeah, was there any discussion at the Planning Commission about rather than having one monolith, having multiple small uh, wireless technologies around the area? No, there was not. Okay. And I, I guess I'm, I'm going to ask the applicant again for a little bit more information on, uh, I mean, ob objectively, 69 feet uh, unhidden is an eyesore. Good 
Good evening, Council Member Rogers, Paul Albert, outside Council for Verizon Wireless. Uh, of course, we had originally proposed a, a camouflage tree, a tree pole, and that was rejected by the Design Review Board that uh, felt that the monopole, the, the, the slimline monopole was uh, more attractive than the, than the faux tree that Verizon Wireless had proposed. The antennas themselves are actually at 65 feet instead of 69 feet. And there are a couple of reasons for that, and Pablo Sanchez, our RF engineer, is here to, can, and can describe that. But when you're setting up a cellular network, it's sort of like sprinklers on a lawn. You're trying to uh, create a dominant signal where a site, uh, the call is, as the car moves from one cell to the other, it transfers and, and achieves another dominant signal. So it's very, very much related to how the network operates. In this case, you've got a number of uh, business businesses around this uh, tower, and that's because we're putting it in a light industrial zone and su surrounded by light industrial buildings, which are 30 to 35 feet tall. So we need, get, we need to get the antennas above that level in order to project the signal above that level. At the same time, there's a requirement under the code that we make this tower co-locatable so that another carrier could place its antennas below our tower, oh, below our antennas in order to minimize the number of towers in the area while also providing service from another carrier. A third factor, and this is relevant to some of the concerns of your community, is that the RF exposure from a tower is reduced uh, exponentially. Uh, you double the distance and you, re and you quadruple the reduction in power levels. So if you begin bringing the antennas down, you been, begin increasing the amount of RF exposure on the ground or on the adjacent rooftops. So another reason for this height is to, is to balance the signal over the rooftops, balance the exposure at that level, at that, at that higher level. There's nobody up there, obviously, at 40 feet in the air, um, 30 feet in the air and then to allow for a co-locator also to go onto the tower. And that's overall network design. In addition, if you bring the tower down, you're gonna reduce the footprint. It's gonna require another tower somewhere. Uh, and it's gonna have to be above the height of those rooftops. So the, the I wanna say cost-benefit analysis is, is, but it's not really cost. It's the design analysis is really that this is the, uh, this would be the preferred network design. As you see, we are right in the middle of a triangle of three other sites. Uh, and if we start putting medium-sized heights, sign, size, high sites in that area along with the small cells, it's, it's poor network design. So those are the principal factors behind that height. And uh, Pablo Sanchez is here. He's our RF design engineer. And Pablo, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and all the council members and the rest of the city officials. I'm Pablo Sanchez, RF Design Engineer with Verizon. I worked with Verizon for 11 years. So going back to the question, um, I started the design to understand the need of the network, where the gap of service in terms of capacity. So. In our existing network, we have three macros exceeding twice its normal operating condition. Instead of mitigating three macros, I essentially locate the probable ring, which is the search area right at the center of these three macros. And then, uh, like our council, Paul Britton said, we have to balance the need of the traffic, the coverage, and the EME. So, Especially on the EMS side of it, when you lower the center line of the antenna, we will be compromising the EME also. That's all I can say. Thank you. So, did we answer your question, sir? So to be really clear, could you achieve the same level of coverage that you were trying to get by lowering the height but having more towers? I asked Pablo to run those numbers, um, and he estimates that he would need approximately 12 small cells to replace this macro tower. And those small cells would have to be in the residential areas exactly where we don't want to go uh, in order to bring the, the, the smaller footprints uh, to, the, to the end users and customers where we're seeing uh, demand. We're seeing quite a bit of demand to the east of this tower in, in the residential zones. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. 
Looking to council to see if there are any additional questions before we move on. Councilmember Alvarez. I appreciate it, Madam Mayor. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about the policy that that San Rosa has developed in res regards to to a multi-language outreach, especially when we want participation from every sector of our community. And I'm hearing the word Roseland mentioned a couple times, whether it's from Verizon Council, as well as the application and a lot of the maps that we're seeing here. And I'm pretty sure that when it comes to Rosen specifically, District 1 as a, as a whole, most notices should be sent out to Rosen in Spanish as it's uh, a language, a Spanish-speaking uh, community. And I'm wondering why that wasn't done and how that affects the, 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 the appeal. So the city does not currently have a requirement for doing Spanish translation. It is something that we try to do when we know that there is a high Spanish population. Um, our noticing requirements are within 600 feet of the site, so I'm not sure. I'd have to do look at the map to see if it actually gets over to the Roseland area. Um, we do have a disclaimer on all of our notices that you know if, if there is a request for Spanish translation, we will provide that. Um, but at this point in time, and it is something that we are looking into and want to you know. Uh, do our best to provide more noticing um, in uh, both Spanish and English, um, but at this point, to my knowledge, it's not required. Uh, I think the, it's almost like the catch-22. How do we ask for it to be in Spanish if we don't know that this is happening for the Spanish speaker? So we're pretty much asking a question which we will never get a response to. And, and for myself, I, I see that as uh, equity justice as well as uh, communication, justice, and, and inclusion, which really, as the city of Santa Rosa, we're really, really looking at, uh, to overcome that hurdle. So I do take great issue with that. Madam City Manager. Uh, so through the chair, Councilman Alvarez, I, I completely agree. Um, this is probably something that should have been caught beforehand. Um, it's probably a little bit hindsight 2020 to apologize, but I do apologize to the residents that did not receive this communication um, in Spanish. Um, but I do, it should be a priority. And if we are talking about Roseland and um, if DEIB is one of our priorities, it is definitely something we should make certain that we look at in the future. City Manager, I appreciate that comment very much. Uh, sadly, that, that, that doesn't, uh, today and today's, and, and through the mayor, I'm sorry. Through the mayor. Uh, and I'm sorry for responding without your, your approval. Oh, no. I was just making, I just said it doesn't make it right. It doesn't correct it. Correct, correct. So, so, but I definitely want to make that known. And, 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 and for the record and for those that might be hearing us on, on the translation that as a city, we are definitely trying to do better to include you in every, and, and I speak for, spas, for, for staff as well as council, that our efforts really are being made to make sure that everyone in the community is included. So I don't look at it as, as something like, a, like, like a, a stain on our efforts, but something that I must, must make uh, publicly known, and hopefully we can do better in the future. Thank you, Council Member Alvarez, for, for bringing that that issue up and Madam City Manager, thank you for acknowledging it. Um, and it is something that we will continue to work on as council members and as staff. Um, but thank you for your hard work on this. This is just something that we need to continue to, to work on. Um, council Member Rogers, you have it, motion. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your comments. I will introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa denying an appeal and upholding the decision of the Planning Commission approving a conditional use permit uh, for a wireless telecommunications tower and associated ground equipment located at 244 Colgan Avenue, APN 044-011-053, file number PRJ23-009, CUP23-043, and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Rogers and a second by Council Member Okrepke. Uh, Madam City Clerk. 
Thank you. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Yes, I will be voting nay on this on the basis of uh, page 14, where I feel that... The no, Vice no, Mayor. No, 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 no. no uh, on, the, on the basis that uh, I wish that we did have subject matter experts that would assist the staff of the City of Santa Rosa to, to make the decisions that sadly are beyond uh, our, our abilities. So nothing on the staff of the City of Santa Rosa. It just happens to be one of the things that I wish I could say we don't know more about, but sadly we don't have the subject matter experts at hand and readily be available. But I do appreciate the efforts of the staff of the City of Santa Rosa to present the best project possible. Thank you. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with five affirmative votes with Councilmember Alvarez voting no and Councilmember Fleming absent. Moving on to item 17, our written communications. Uh, we have 17.1, notice a final map for a review. Madam City Clerk, can you please conduct public comment on this item? Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 17.1. If you'd like to make public comment, please make your way to the podium if you have not provided a speaker card or your name. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for item 17.1. Thank you. We'll continue to item 18. That's our second public comment on non-agenda matters. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 18, non-agenda matters. This is a time when anyone who was not previously addressed the council under item 14, public comment on non-agenda matters, can speak. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide public comment but have not provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Again, this is the second public comment period for non-agenda matters. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for the item 18 non-agenda matters. All right, we have come to our, our last item, which is adjournment. I would like to uh, close the meeting tonight in honor of Detective Mary Lou. As we approach the anniversary of Santa Rosa Police Detective Mary Lou Armour's passing due to the devastating effects of the coronavirus pandemic, her untimely death on March 31st, 2020 marked a tragic milestone in our history as she became the first California police officer to, su to succumb to the coronavirus. It has been four years since Detective Armour, a dedicated member of our force, left us too soon at the age of 43. Detective Armour's legacy is one of commitment, compassion, and courage. Throughout her career, she exemplified the essence of law enforcement, working to ensure the safety and well-being of those she swore to protect. Detective Armour is survived by her husband and daughter. Detective Armour began her career at the Santa Rosa Police Department as a field evidence technician in 1999 before becoming a police officer in 2008. She finished her career as a domestic violence sexual assault detective where she demonstrated exceptional bravery and selflessness, spending her final weeks in service contacting victims in local hospitals, helping to provide services and guiding them through the court process. I want to thank Detective Armour and her family for her service and ultimate sacrifice for our community. I also want to offer my support to all our police personnel as they remember our loss this week. To the Santa Rosa police personnel, especially those who worked alongside Detective Armour, I extend my sincerest support and in solidarity with you. In her remembrance, let us reaffirm our commitment to service and sacrifice that inspire us all. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.